thank you for this beautiful, thank you for all the wonderful blessings that we enjoy. Thank you for our city and our staff, my fellow council <coughs> members. I pray for those who are ill. Please heal them. As we discuss the items on the agenda tonight, please give us a spirit of cooperation and wisdom to make the best decision. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you'll, oh, meeting's called to order, and if you'll rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll move to number three, uh, open forum. Open forum is an opportunity for citizens to speak about items not listed on the agenda. And in order to address city council, you must complete a form uh, prior to the uh, meeting. Do we have anyone to speak this morning? No. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, so we'll move on to the consent, ag consent agenda. Uh, is there anything to be removed from the consent agenda? Okay. Hearing none. Do I have an, a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve it, kind of uh, consent agenda. Thank you, sir. Do I have a second? I'll second. Just having a second. Thank you. Any discussion? Those in favor, signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Okay, that will take us to number six, the regular agenda. Um, re receiving discussion, initial assessment regarding whether redistricting is required for the city council member districts considering the new 2020 census data, and if so, discuss and consider a resolution adopting criteria for use in the 2021 redistricting process, and a resolution adopting guidelines for public participation in the redistricting process. City Manager Canizares. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Mario Canizares, City Manager. Uh, tonight or today is the kickoff of the redistricting process. This is a process that goes every 10 years at the conclusion of the decennial census. So last time you all did th went through this process was back more than likely back in 2011. Uh, normally the census data is provided to the respective entities, usually in the, usually in the spring in the March-April time frame. However, this year, the data was not submitted to the local entities until at least September. Uh, as a result, uh, cities, counties, and school districts, those that have single-member districts, are going through the redistricting process as we speak. Uh, here most recently, the counties, including Nacogdoches County, uh, completed their redistricting process. And again, because of the timing of when the data was released, everyone's behind. And so we're at a process now that we are working to get this process started for, for the city. Uh, the school districts in the same uh, time frame as we are. In fact, they started their process, I believe, last Thursday. And so we're literally just about a few days, give or take, behind, and, and in some cases maybe even ahead of the school district. And so that's not certainly any, anyone's fault. It's just when the data was released, and so we really couldn't get started until that information was released. Um, both, uh, well, all three, the school district, the city, and the county, have, have engaged with the firm of Bickerstaff, Heath, Delgado, and Acosta. It's an attorney's firm, and they are helping all three entities with, with the redistricting process. As I'd mentioned, uh, the county has just recently completed theirs, and we're starting ours. And one of the reasons why we felt this time all three entities working together, uh, while we have different agreements, separate agreements, we thought it was important to work collectively as an entity here for Nacogdoches County. And while the school district and the city are separate entities, we're actually working together on trying to come up with their appropriate dates for some of the public meetings and hearings that we're going to have. Not hearings, but public uh, meetings that we're going to have based on the map. So instead of having four meetings, we're, like, we're looking to have two, so split between the city and, and the school district. And so trying to work together to make it not as onerous on the public, especially since we're on a shortened time frame. Uh, we have to get this process completed by... I believe it was January the 19th, uh, a lot of it because of the filing period for, for, the, for the city and school district uh, uh, elections that are coming up. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Arnold, uh, Philip Arnold. He is with, uh, with the firm Bickerstaff, Heath, Delgado, and Acosta. He will go through the initial assessment, lay out a timeline of when um, some of the next uh, series of meetings we'll have with, with council, 
and a timeline that we'll be having conversations with the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Arnold, unless you all have any questions before we get started. Okay, I'll turn it over to Mr. Arnold. And he's online, so uh, so he's going to be navigating the presentation, and he's, he's working remotely. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. Um, as uh, the city manager said, I'm with Baker Step Heath Delgado on Acosta, and we performed an initial assessment to determine whether or not the city of Nacogdoches needs to redistrict. And this presentation has two parts. The first part will discuss the, uh, it's a short summary of the relevant law regarding redistricting. And the second part will go into detail about the uh, city of Nacogdoches and uh, what the data from the 2020 census shows us. And let me get to our first slide here. Uh, the first slide is, uh, this is really just the, the plan of what the project will take us through. So this is each step as we go through the process. We're at the first step, which is the initial assessment. Uh, we will discuss adopting the criteria and guidelines uh, that you all have uh, before you in resolutions uh, to consider passing tonight. Uh, then we will work with the city to develop illustrative plans, have any public comment periods uh, or hearings. I believe we have two scheduled joint, jointly with the ISD. Uh, we will analyze those comments and then make any changes to the plans as we work towards adopting a final plan. And then finally implementing uh, the final plan, which is adopting the new redistricting maps. This is our timeline. So we're tonight at the initial assessment. Uh, we have two drawing workshops set up, one in November and one in December. Uh, the public presentations are scheduled for January 5th and 6th. And then final adoption is currently scheduled for January 18th. The next slide is talking about the applicable uh, redistricting principles. Uh, there's two, uh, two main principles and then some qualifications to those. So the first one is one person, one vote, which is the 14th Amendment requirement that uh, the districts be in roughly equal population. Uh, we'll get into detail of, about how we determine what is equal population between the districts in a second. The second consideration is complying with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which means uh, we do not discriminate against any ethnic or racial minorities. And then Shaw versus Reno, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case that limits the use of race. Uh, and we'll go into a little bit of detail about how we balance uh, the Section 2 Voting Rights Act requirement and the Shaw versus Reno limitation. And then finally, you may be aware that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act uh, was ruled unconstitutional, or rather how it's implemented, it was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so retrogression is not a legal standard we have to comply with, uh, but it is uh, one of the criteria we will consider uh, because it is, uh, we, could, we think it is the best practice to consider it as we work through the process. Retrogression being that we, uh, meaning that we do not draw districts that um, essentially discriminate or retrogress, uh, draw districts that if you have a majority minority district, you try to keep it a majority minority district as, as much as possible. So uh, the one person, one vote principle comes from uh, the US Constitution uh, and for single member districts that they must have approximately equal population. The rule of thumb is a 10% total deviation, and that is a deviation between the biggest and smallest district are uh, no greater than 10% different. Uh, the 10% comes from case law from the Supreme Court, uh, which essentially says that uh, if you're within that 10% differential, 10% or less, then you are assumed to be uh, in roughly equal uh, proportion to each other. So in order to determine that, uh, we determine the most populous and least populous districts and the ideal size district. And uh, we take the most populous and least populous. And this next slide will show us an example. So this would be a, a city with four districts totaling 40,000 people. Uh, the ideal district size would be 40,000 divided by four. 
which is 10,000 people in each district. Uh, in this example, we have a total population of District A, which would be the largest district of 11,000 people. District D being the smallest district of 8,000 people. Uh, you take the difference between those. Uh, so, uh, for example, District A has 10% larger than the ideal size and District D is 20% smaller than the ideal size. We add the 10 and 20% together, even though the 20% is a, a negative number, you add them together, uh, and that equals a 30% deviation. So the biggest district and the smallest district are 30% uh, different in size from each other. So we want that to be a 10% differential. Section two of the Voting Rights Act uh, says that uh, we should not discriminate on the basis of race or language or minority status and to avoid packing and fracking. Fracking or fracturing is dividing minority voters into multiple districts in order to fragment their vote. Uh, so that may be an example where if drawn together, a minority group could theoretically uh, contain enough voters to elect a candidate of their choosing but they are fracked and cracked into uh, multiple districts in order to dilute their ability to do that. Packing is the opposite of that, where you may have a minority group who could theoretically make up the majority of two districts, uh, but you pack them all into one district in order to prevent them from electing uh, two uh, elected members of their choosing. So uh, Shaw versus Reno is really the, the opposite uh, kind of standard of, or the ceiling maybe of, of section two. And that's a US Supreme Court case that says race may not be the predominant factor uh, to traditional districting principles, which we'll get to in a second what those traditional districting principles are. So it's okay to be aware of race and to consider it to satisfy section five, uh, which doesn't apply to us at the moment, but we're looking at it and, and particularly section two, but you should use uh, race no more than necessary. And they use the phrase narrowly tailor uh, the maps to take race into consideration. And particularly bizarrely shaped districts, which are not unconstitutional per se, but there may be some evidence that race was a factor when you drew the districts. So here we have an example of what we would consider a bizarrely shaped district. Uh, this was Harris County uh, in a plan the legislature drew uh, for congressional districts. The top was uh, before what the legislature drew, uh, and the bottom was after the Bush versus Vera case was resolved and how it was drawn uh, by the courts. So you can see kind of the bizarre shape of the red area in the original map. And also note how in the bottom map, uh, the district is not only um, more evenly shaped, but it's also more compact. So compactness is something we'll look at. It's difficult to measure mathematically. There are some tools that we can use to do it, but it's difficult to measure mathematically because cities are not perfect circles. Uh, so just using math is difficult to do, but you can look and see that obviously the, the bottom map is much more compact than the top. Here we have our criteria, and this is one of the resolutions uh, that'll be before you tonight to pass. And these are the criteria we'll consider as we go through the redistricting process. The first one is to use identifiable boundaries as the district lines. So these could be rivers, lakes, uh, parks, roads, things like that, that the general public can uh, look at and say that this road divides this district from this district. The other is to maintain communities of interest and neighborhoods together. Uh, the idea of this is to uh, essentially allow people of a particular community or neighborhood to more adequately elect somebody uh, who represents their views. Using whole voting precincts if possible, and voting precincts are essentially the, uh, the blocks that the county creates in order to, um, uh, they are composed of one representative of the U.S. House, the State House, the State Senate, and the State Board of Education. Um, and so 
those we like to keep together if at all possible. Uh, and it's not always possible to do, but we like to keep them together. One, because uh, county elections administrators uh, like to have whole voting precincts and larger voting precincts if possible. Uh, but also because if you get into splitting voting precincts on a granular level, it can be some evidence that you're using race inappropriately to redistrict. The next criteria is to base plans on the existing district. So that's not to start from whole cloth, but to take what we have and make the changes we need to in order to put the population in balance. The next criteria is to adopt districts of roughly equal size that we've covered before with a 10% differential. Uh, then drawing districts that are compact and contiguous, and we saw that with the Bush versus Vera map about what compactness looks like. Contiguous just means that the districts touch each other. Uh, and we'll see with the city of Nacogdoches here in a couple of slides, uh, your, your okay. districts do, uh, but what you can't do is have a district broken up by another district. So they have to physically touch each other in some way. Uh, you also look to keep incumbents in their existing districts uh, because, uh, as the Supreme Court has said, people have elected uh, the uh, elected representatives of their choosing, and they're entitled to keep those elected representatives. And then, of course, we narrowly tailor the plan to comply with the Voting Rights Act, as we discussed with the uh, Shaw versus Reno standard. So here we have uh, the benchmark, what we call the benchmark uh, standard for the city of Nacogdoches. So this is what the wards currently look like in the city. Uh, we've numbered them for sake of the charts. It's a little easier, uh, but I understand you all call them uh, the Southwest and Southeast and Northeast and Northwest wards. Uh, so this is what we have right now. This, and I apologize, it's a little blurry, uh, is uh, Part of the initial assessment packet we sent you. So this will show you the people who live in each district. And you can see on the bottom, the total population of the city is 32,131 people. That divided by four is how we get our ideal size of 8,033 people. And then you can see the overall deviation at the bottom in blue is 13.11% which is the difference between, as we said, the biggest and smallest district. In this case, the largest district by population is District 2, or I'm sorry, District 1, and the smallest district is District 2. Uh, and then as you continue across uh, the lines there, you can see the breakdown of Hispanic population of each district, uh, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic Asian, and other. Uh, and then we have other charts that break this uh, down in a greater detail, but uh, this is generally the populations that we need to consider for the city. Uh, here we have the same chart, and this is showing voting age population of each district. Uh, so you can see the number of people over the age of 18. It does not consider who is a citizen because there was not a citizenship question, uh, but this is people who live in each district over the age of 18. We can use the voting age population to comply with the Voting Rights Act if we need to. One person, one vote under the 14th Amendment requires the total population to be used to put the districts in balance. But to determine if we're discriminating against any minority groups, uh, we can also look to the voting age population. So this next map is what we call a thematic map, and we have two. The first one here is the Hispanic thematic map. And this map shows the uh, relative concentration of Hispanics within the city. Uh, and as you can see on the legend on the bottom right, the darker shade of red indicates more concentration of Hispanics within a certain, uh, these blocks are, um, I believe they are census blocks. Uh, so within each census block, which is the basic building block the census uses, uh, we can see the relative uh, portion of Hispanics in that block. Now I'll caution that it does not tell you how many people live in the block. Uh, so as we go, for example, uh, on the bottom side, uh, if you can see right here, uh, there's not a lot of people who live in this area. Uh, I looked at it earlier and I believe there's um, think about 10 people who live there. So showing that over 60% of the population is Hispanic tells us something, but it doesn't tell us where the population of the city is. 
And for that, we'll need to look uh, as part of the drawing process, we can get into where the actual numbers of people are. These maps can be useful just to tell you kind of generally where uh, any minority groups live within the city. The next map is the African American thematic map. And again, this shows the same thing. Uh, the darker shade of green uh, shows more concentration of African Americans. Uh, but again, it doesn't show uh, total population numbers. So it can be a little deceiving, but it generally gives you an idea of, of where African Americans live within the city. And again, uh, this slide just tells us again our total process of what we're going through here. We're at the initial assessment and adopting the criteria and guidelines. And this is finally again our timeline to do that, to uh, adopt the guidelines uh, tonight if we want to. Uh, we should adopt the guidelines before the first drawing workshop on November 16th if, if at the latest, uh, so that they're in place before we start drawing any maps. And that's all I have for you, council members. Do you all have any questions for me? Uh, I'd like to open it first to a public comment. Anyone in the audience care to participate or to comment? Okay. Council, any comments? Mr. Anderson? I don't particularly at this point, anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Fisher? Sure. Um, hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, in looking at the drawing of the maps, I mean, I guess it's not as um, strangely drawn as the maps from the Bush um, v. Vera case, but it doesn't quite look like a logical drawing of maps to me. Um, does it to you? I, I just, I don't have experience in this. Um, does that look like something normal to you? Um, what does what look like? Something the, the current concerned. map, the way the, that the current districts are drawn. Um, it's difficult to say. I mean, sometimes cities have to be drawn in a certain way in order to uh, capture the population that you need. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to draw everything squarely. Um, I have drawn counties uh, that where a commissioner's precinct may stretch all the way across the county. Uh, and that's just because of the majority, there's not a lot of population and there may be a big city in the northern part of the county where we need to capture some population. So um, okay. it's not inherently um, wrong or bad. Uh, it's something we can look at about balancing. Um, and with the city, um, you know, it might have been drawn that way in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act uh, mm -hmm. and the non-retrogression standard that was in place in 2010 in order to maintain uh, an uh, African-American district or a Hispanic district. That's what, that was gonna be my follow-up question. If you thought, uh, I mean, because it kind of depends how you look at it, right? I mean, <clears throat> District 2, I guess, or the Southwest Ward is what we call it, um, but 2 on the map is obviously majority Hispanic. Um, and then one, the Southeast is obviously majority black. Um, and I understand that you can use race as a consideration in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act. And so in that sense, it might have been for the purposes of making sure that a majority Hispanic population has representation on the city council and same for black um, population. Um, or it could be packing. Right, um, and so I wanted to ask your opinion on that. I'm not trying to um, beat anybody up or anything back from 2010. I just want to figure out if there were things that we can do better this time around. Yes, and I think if you look at breaking those up, um, sometimes it's difficult, uh, particularly with Hispanic communities, because they don't um, the Hispanic population in Texas generally came to Texas after uh, segregation ended. Um, and so they're not concentrated in particular areas of a city uh, like African-American populations often are. Uh, and then of course, over time, the African-American populations themselves have kind of uh, grown throughout the city and are not as concentrated. So keeping a particular district Hispanic or African-American can be very difficult. Um, and 
you look at trying to uh, keep, uh, you know, essentially the districts the way they are uh, and keeping the uh, minority communities intact as much as possible. Uh, so sometimes that may be kind of going across town to do it. Uh, but even that can be difficult because sometimes you may have to cross, for example, a, a, in order because they have to be contiguous, you may have to absorb a certain amount of uh, white population, for example, in order to reach a Hispanic pocket uh, that may be next to the district you want to put it in. But um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's packing uh, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's cracking. Uh, I think it really just depends on on how you look at it. Um, you know, the African-American population in the city is really split between one and two for the most part. Uh, it's pretty heavily concentrated in one. Um, you know, if you broke it up out of one, uh, you could be accused of cracking in that situation. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's really a delicate balance. Okay. Um, and then my last question for you, um, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys do this regularly, consult with governmental entities to, to help them with redistricting. Um, and so my question to you is, are there any other criteria or guidelines that you've seen other cities, counties, school districts, whatever, use that you have found to be helpful that were not included in your presentation? I've seen them use other criteria. Um, I haven't particularly found them to be helpful. Uh, typically, they will be uh, something like including non-retrogression uh, in their criteria. Um, I've seen them, um, you know, uh, use a criteria that says you should not consider where incumbents live. I don't think that's particularly helpful. Um, it, so there are slight variations to it. Um, I think the criteria we have are good. Um, in, the reason we have the criteria we have is because they're based on Supreme Court case law and what the courts have said we should use as traditional districting criteria. So it doesn't mean that they are the only criteria you could use, but they are uh, the, the, the tested criteria. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bowen? Thank you, ma'am. When I, when I first looked at the map, I, my first thought was there was packing in uh, Ward 1, Southeast Ward. But now my question is, did the voters' age population, do you believe it played a part in, in geographics of the Ward 1? Generally speaking, the voting age population is going to be roughly proportional to the overall population. Um, that's typically more true with African Americans if we're looking at minorities than it is with Hispanics, just because Hispanics tend to be a younger population overall. That's not necessarily true in every city, but you can maybe make that kind of broad statement. Uh, but generally speaking, voting age populations tend to track pretty closely as a percentage of a uh, total population. And well, basically, I don't, I don't know the numbers that you passed out originally, like Ward 1 was 8,400, and I'm thinking that's population, and the voting age population was 62, 64, which is pretty close to being, well, in the middle of the group. Uh, on a high average. Uh, geographic wise, I know this has been in place for a while, uh, but I do believe that one of the areas that I would like to see looked at and for a change to be made. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bellinger? Um, I'd like would you mind expounding on that? I'd like to hear the change. I mean, is that what you'd like to see? What, what, Just a ward 4, a Northwest Ward. I think the population, I know they geographic-wise to include African-American in Ward 1. Mm -hmm. This is why they went into Ward 4. Right, right. But 
generally speaking, I would like to see it spread it out more between two and four. You mean that yep. section that looks kind of split up, uh, split off? Is yes. The, the, the between yeah. two and four? Yeah. But it may not be able to do that because of the population. We, don't, we really right now don't know where the growth was. Well, the, the census data is there to know that. Um, yes, sir. The, the growth was really, it appears to be in uh, District 1, what we're calling District 1, and probably District 3 as well. Um, neither one of those by themselves are particularly out of balance. The real out of balance is that District 2 shrunk by 8.5%, or is 8.5% off of the norm. So either it, it lost population or it did not grow as fast as the others. District four is within, um, let's see, about 40 people of the ideal size. Um, and district three is about 300 people of the ideal size, a little less than that. So four and three are generally, I mean, you could probably equal the population between the districts without touching four and three if you wanted to. What you really need to do is take some population from one and put it into two, uh, but overall boost the population to two to get that negative eight and a half percent number up. So it's closer to the ideal size. So we really need to add population to two uh, and probably take some population from uh, one or three. I now agree, that, I agree that, with that. Yeah, and, and, and that's not the only way you can do it. You, you can do this a lot of different ways, but if you're looking at the, the easiest way with, the, with um, the least amount of changes, uh, that's, I would probably uh, look at one and two is probably my focal point. Mr. Canizares? Yes, uh, Mayor, members of council. Mr. Arnold, uh, th that's part of the process that, we're gonna, that the council will be going through on November the 16th is, is working with your staff, uh, your GIS staff, your ge uh, geographic information system staff to work with those lines and, and move lines around to see where you pick up population, you lose populations. That's part of that process is a redrawing process on your November 16th meeting. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, so what we will do when we come to the uh, first drawing workshop is we'll consult with uh, the city and develop a, an uh, illustrative we call it. So that'll be a starting place for us to look at uh, so that you all can see and the public can see a way of drawing the districts that puts the population in balance. Uh, it's not the only way, as I said, uh, but it's really just a jumping off point for us. And then from there in that meeting, we'll make changes in real time to the map and we will draw the lines, add territory to one district, take it away from a different district. Uh, and then as we do that, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll have you'll have the map at the top of the screen showing the changes we're making. And then at the bottom of the screen, you'll have uh, essentially the same chart I showed you earlier, uh, which is a spreadsheet that will update those population and uh, racial and ethnic breakdowns in real time so we can see what those changes did. So we can see not only the population that moved, but uh, the percentages of each ethnicity that moved with it. And uh, we'll just keep making changes like that until we reach a point uh, where everyone's happy uh, or where you want to take a break and uh, go present the plan to the public and get public comment, uh, come back, make some more changes, and just continue that process until we reach a, a point where everyone wants to vote on the map. Mr. Bell, anything else? No, I'm good. Thank you. Ms. Bellinger? Um, I, I think the criteria that you shared with us looks really appropriate to me. I have nothing else to say about it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. A anyone else? Okay. Well, um, thank you for your presentation. And let's see, we uh, will consider a resolution adopting criteria for use in the 2021 redistricting process and a re resolution adopting guidelines for public participation in the re redistricting process. A motion. So moved. Moved, Mr. Anderson. Second. I have a second. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
Those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. You disappeared from my screen. I, I, I jumped the gun. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take some. Okay. <laughs> All right, we will move to B, receive an update and hold a discussion regarding the 87th Le Texas Legislative Session and subsequent special sessions. Uh, City Manager Ken Azaris. Yes, uh, Mayor, members of council, will be really brief to allow Mr. Barnes to come up here and, and make some comments to you and hopefully certainly an allow you to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Kelly Barnes represents uh, the city of Nacogdoches with Hillco uh, Partners. They are our legislative advocates that we use uh, uh, during the legislative session and also during the interim session. Um, as you know, this session was one that would not end. It started uh, as normal in, in early uh, January, ended at the end of May, and then they had three subsequent special sessions to hammer out a number of issues by Governor Abbott. Um, uh, we've used uh, Kelly and his team on a number of things, uh, not just legislatively, to also work with uh, the various uh, administrative agencies at, at the state. At the state, I mean, it's a it's a big it's a big bureaucracy, and Mr. Barnes and his folks are, have been very helpful to get things across the finish line for us. And so, with that, I wanted to turn over to Kelly, let him make a few comments. And some of you have never met Kelly, but uh, but uh, he's he's uh, really done well for us. And and usually, Larissa during the session. Larissa and I usually meet with him on a pretty regular basis, once every week, if not once every couple of weeks, to just go over updates of what's going on in the session. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Barnes and let him make some comments to you and, and ask, you know, have you, any, uh, have you asked any questions of him? Thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, happy, yeah, happy to, be to be here. Thank you, Mayor, Thank you, Mayor and Council. And council. Uh, I wish I'd I wish been I'd here a little sooner. Sooner. Um, okay, I echo in some way. You sound, you sound good. good. <laughs> you did There's too. a speaker There's outside, speaker outside somewhere. somewhere. A certain amount of gravitas there. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll tell my wife that. Um, well, thank you all for having me tonight. I, I wish I would have been here in, you know, late May or June, but uh, we kept, as Mario said, st sticking around in Austin way too long. Um, with three special sessions, you know, it's normally every other year. It's 140 days and they're gone. Um, that was not the case at all. So. Uh, we just got a break uh, October 18th. They gaveled out, so we're hopefully knock on wood in the clear um, until January of 2023, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So um, got a presentation here. Can I just click it through? Okay, perfect. It's, it's short and sweet, so. If I can do it just right here, click a button. There we go. Perfect. Um, so I wanted to highlight two different things tonight, one being some state agency assistance we've done for the city of Nacogdoches and then kind of some broad topics from the legislative session. So four main agencies, and we've done a, a variety of work for all of them, but kind of the biggest I would say for your city has been the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Um, you know, that's an agency that normally deals with hurricane response on the coast, um, weather issues, tornadoes across Texas, that's been their primary job. Um, but when COVID hit, the governor kind of tasked them to be the agency to take care of about every state response. So we all know a lot of federal money was flowing down to the state and to local municipalities. And so TDEM had criteria for what's an allowable expense, what's not an allowable expense. And I think we were able to help streamline um, the city's communication with TDEM executive staff at the top to truly determine what's okay and what's not okay. Because as we all know, a lot of these funds are going to be audited at some point down the line since there was so much money um, the federal government pushed down. And so just providing that kind of streamlined communication to, for you guys to understand what was okay. Um, TCQ, um, during the February winter storm, you know, critical infrastructure went offline all across the state um, and your water treatment facility as well had a major issue. And so getting that back online, there's certain criteria that TCQ requires you to accomplish to get that going again. Uh, we were able to work with the Mario and the executive director of the commission to determine how you could turn on certain sectors faster by tr testing those samples instead of t testing the whole. So allowing you to get certain sectors on faster um, was something we worked on. And then um, Texas Department of Agriculture, that's something we're working on kind of currently, I would say. Um, there's a revolving loan fund over there for small businesses, and it's been backlogged for over a year, if not more, I think, Mario. Um, 
and getting staff to recognize this is important and put it on the top of the agenda to get those funds moving and um, not providing repetitive material, which I think was the issue um, from us getting those funds out the door for you guys. And then uh, TABC, the Texas Alcohol Beverage Commission, I think it relates a little bit to COVID as well that they changed so many restrictions on what's a bar, what's a restaurant, how do you get to be a restaurant if you're a bar, and so making sure that a lot of your local businesses were able to meet the new TABC criteria um, and not be penalized for doing something wrong. Any questions on that? Move on to the session. So as I mentioned, we started in January, ended in May, and then three more special sessions. The first one was supposed to be um, on election-related legislation. The Democrats broke quorum in that first session. Um, so the first session was effectively dead. Second session, they came back, quorum was made. The election legislation was the primary topic of that session. And then the third special had always been redistricting. So I know you guys just got a real thorough presentation um, on how that looks. And you can imagine you know, a state of 30 million people drawing Senate lines, House of Representative lines, and congressional lines in less than 30 days is, uh, is interesting, uh, to be blunt. So a couple quick issues from the session I want to touch on with you guys. Economic development, a big issue that changes. Um, chapter 313s uh, basically have been sunset. Um, there were multiple opportunities to revive that and extend it down the line, and it got caught up in a lot of uh, political discussions basically at the end. All that to say is that December 1st of 2022, um, there'll be no new 313 agreements. Now, what I think will happen is it'll be a top-of-the-line issue in January of 2023 to get going again, but there's going to be a lag, and so you know, is there going to be an executive order from the governor or something later on? We'll see, but that's something to note for you guys. Um, alcohol to go. Um, restaurants have seen a big boom, obviously, allowing mixed beverage permit holders to sell alcohol to go. And then broadband, House Bill 5, that created a new broadband council. It's going to be at the comptroller's office. Um, and they actually received $500 million um, in ARPA funds via the state legislature. So the big concern had always been, that's great, we're creating a broadband council, but are we going to fund it and really put some teeth into it? And, and they did. Um, electricity. Um, a number of things passed and a number of things didn't pass, but SB3 basically establishes um, the Texas Energy Reliability Council, and one of the big things is designating critical infrastructure um, to make sure that we don't have issues like last time with a water treatment facility or various other things across the state, because you guys weren't the only ones who had a major issue with that. Um, property taxes, also a number of things, but one recent thing from the last special session is that SJR2 um, will be on the May ballot, and it'll increase the ex homestead exemption on the ISD portion of property taxes from 25 to 40, um, if approved in May, obviously. Something to note. Two more issues I'll touch on, budget and local control. Um, Texas passed a $200 billion budget um, in May. Um, they got it done, and then obviously we had a, a number of uh, federal spending programs to take care of. The most recent one is the ARPA funds that the legislature addressed. I did a quick highlight of, uh, I'm not going to go down each one, but uh, you can see there's some things that are interesting to Nacogdoches. Obviously, rural hospital grants, um, tuition revenue bonds at higher education institutions, SFA will get in there. Um, and then also, you know, the health care shortage uh, we saw across the state and uh, antibody infusion centers and reimbursing um, for that was a big issue. And then local control, um, couple of big issues this session. Um, the camping ban probably took the most attention, I would say. It was primarily aimed at um, the city of Austin um, and, and some of their policies down there. So that's out there, creates kind of a statewide framework for um, um, camping in public places. Um, and then other issues, but I would say, you know, speaking broadly on local control, rural cities got a little better situation than urban cities. You'll see a lot of the bills that pass, and I'm happy to provide more context later, but um, exemptions for rural cities and counties on a lot of issues that um, I'm not going to touch on because they don't impact you guys. And then uh, the final thing, redistricting, I guess it's kind of timely with the presentation you guys just had, but um, if all of your incumbents are reelected, Travis Clardy will be your state representative, Robert Nichols will be your state senator, and then you'll obviously get a big change. Um, and your congressman will be from Waco, Texas, uh, Pete Sessions. So that's um, quite a shift um, from a geography 
geographic standpoint. Um, and that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions on, on any topic that um, has your attention. I'll do my best to answer. Okay. Ms. Bellinger? I have one little question. <laughs> Tell me about the Texas Department of Agriculture. What's holding all of that up, um, uh, those funds? Uh, well, uh, one thing is staff turnover. TDA turned over quite a bit of staff recently. And so you get someone new working on y'all's project who's emailing with um, Steve Bartlett and um, asking for documents that you guys have provided multiple times already. And so it's that kind of backlog. And so elevating it to a senior staff at, at the agency to say, hey, we've already provided this. Can, can we cut through a lot of this and get this moving? Because the city's ready to spend these funds. They don't want to jump and spend it without getting the full green light from you guys. So. And Will that affect um, any new grants? I mean, it, it should speed up if we apply for other funds. From it should at TDA, TDA, but I mean, you, you'll see this at various state agencies. It's it's, it's just breaking through sometimes um, to the top because uh, things get lost and they're short staffed. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry. Anything else, Ms. Bellinger? No. Mr. Thank you, Mayor. The funds, uh, COVID funds. Are there a lot of funds still in waiting, <coughs> I mean, to be spent? Um, some there are. So they didn't spend all of the ARPA money. So okay. there's, you know, $17 billion in this latest round. We didn't spend it all. We spent about $13, $14 billion of it, I want to say, off the top of my head. Some of that they want to save towards next session to, you know, fill any budget shortfalls that might exist or a future special. But it does, the governor does have the ability um, to use those funds um, now that the legislature is out. So, yes. There is money still left. Okay, and is that federal fund, is GLO handling all of that? Are they coordinating all of that fund? No, so the governor, on the, on the ARPA stuff, the latest round, okay. this is a governor's office. Okay. So he put it on the special session call for the legislators to address. If he did not do that, he could have put out how he'd like, you know, this money to be spent. So um, technically he does have the authority to okay. go ahead and activate some of those funds. Um, our representative Travis Clardy, he also picked up all the way down to Newton, Texas, didn't he? Uh, Newton County. He's he's got a, a much harder district um, to commute in, I would say. Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. But, Thank uh, you very much. That was a good call. Mm. Yeah. Ms. Fisher. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I saw that you mentioned SB three in the Texas Energy Reliability Council establishment and their monitoring of critical infrastructure, but I did not hear. Um, any explicit mention of the power grid? Um, was there anything done to address that specifically? Well, I'll, I'll kind of tell you yes uh, and no. So um, I, th I think in the press has reported a lot on this. There was no you know, huge substantive reform to the grid that necessarily took place during session. But what they did is truly opened up the Public Utility Commission. <clears throat> um, so what you're seeing right now is the PUC chairman, Peter Lake, who's actually from Tyler, Texas, who came in after the you know, bad storm and everything, he's been given free reign to open the rule book on power generators, gas generators, transmission. So they are doing some heavy work right now. But as far as what the legislature passed to fix any issues from the grid, it was, you know, the board of ERCOT has to be from the state of Texas now as opposed to being from anywhere, things like that. Um, you know, administrative type? I would say administrative type, but I will say the PUC is doing some heavy work right now that I think um, um, will, will put us in much better shape going into this um, winter season. Thank you. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? No, uh, the questions that I had were about ARPA funds and uh, ERCOT reform, so um, you've already answered the, but those. But uh, thank you for the presentation. It has, I'm sure, been a challenging year. Um, to uh, do what you do. <laughs> well, I'm ready to spend time with my 10-month-old baby if I had in the middle of session, which is never smart. So thank you all for having me. I, I have yeah. one question. Uh, there, there's been some question of us regarding exterior building materials that can be used in residential construction. I know the legislature took some action on that maybe a session or two ago. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so that was um, actually 2019 session. So um, I guess the 86th re regular session would be the number on it. Um, basically, the Texas Association of Builders, very strong advocacy group in Austin, um, has members of their group who have, you know, 
building homes in Dallas and Houston and San Angelo and across the state, and we're dealing with different city code regulations on building materials. And so they basically, from their standpoint, was we need a uniform set of standards for our members across the state. And I think cities interpret it as, well, you're just taking that control away from us. Um, but that was 2019. So basically, uh, you know, you don't have the ability to regulate uh, building materials um, at all unless it's a, you know, historical cultural area um, and or hailstorm, windstorm areas in the path of a storm, you have the ability. But I mean, it's a national standard you get to use, which is very vague. Um, you know, someone made a joke one day that you can have a, a home made out of hail bay next to a home, you know, a 4,000 square foot new brick McMansion. According to law, you can. So, okay. yeah, it's an unfortunate situation for cities, to say the least. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Any anything? You got any follow up? Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. We appreciate you being here. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll move on to C. Receive a report, hold a discussion, and give staff direction regarding the establishment of an advisory comprehensive plan review committee and a downtown master plan review committee. Uh, City Manager Canizares. Here we are again. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. So really uh, just wanted to give a presentation to you all to kind of get some direction. Let me grab my pen. Mm -hmm. Uh, really just to give uh, get some direction from council on the committees we've been talking about the studies and the merits and of the studies etc and so those are still yet to be decided as far as a contract but um, but there is that process on the committees that did you know council gave direction back in earlier this summer uh, of establishing a, uh, some committees and so really just wanted to spend some time and, and make sure that we're on the right track so that if if we are going to move forward, we can go ahead and, and bring those things to fruition. So uh, the first slide that I have here is just sort of the process. And, and so I don't know if it's been uh, uh, just hasn't really been communicated, but I just wanted to share this with council. It's not overly complicated. But again, if, if, if we were to start, if council were to approve contracts to, for this process, I uh, just wanted to kind of show the start and the finish. And you had this in your packet. The only change that was made from when the uh, packet was sent over to you. Literally, all those two graphics, uh, the start and the finish and the arrows and the arrow, green arrow and the red arrow, everything else is still the same. Just wanted to kind of uh, just expand on that a little bit just to articulate where it starts and when it stops. And so, um, again, if, if, the, if the contracts are approved uh, in, in later the next month, um, uh, we would issue a notice to proceed. The consultant would theoretically get started on the projects. Um, they would do the project kickoff. Uh, they would start getting uh, engaging citizens, uh, doing a number of different things, whether it's uh, holding community forums, uh, the various surveys, all the various things that we've talked about in the past. Um, this is the expectation that we would have of, of the consultants. You all have said that citizen engagement is a large component of this process. This is important to you all. It's important to staff. It's important to the project. And so they would be doing that. Along the way, as ideas and input and feedback is received and given from the consultant uh, uh, to the to the citizens and to the citizens to, from the from the citizens to the consultant, uh, eventually these ideas would be presented uh, and to a committee, which is what we're here to talk about the committee process. And so, um, as the committee reviews this information from the consultant, uh, as they've engaged the community, as the community has come to to these various meetings through a survey or meetings in the box uh, that has been discussed before, um, that's where this information comes. And so it comes to the committee for a review. Uh, ultimately, if the committee uh, hears, hears this and sees this through the work with the consultant, work with the community and the citizens, um, ultimately it would be passed on to the advisory board, which would be your planning and zoning commission and the downtown, the, excuse me, the Main Street, uh, uh, Main Street Association. Uh, the intent is to be able to review those recommendations uh, ultimately through a public hearing process. Um, they would then uh, vote those out of committee just like they would recommend any kind of planning and zoning commission or other proposal ultimately to you all as city council. Um, there would be another public hearing process for that. Um, and we can have one, we can have multiple public hearings. It just depends on really how, how you all want to formulate that. But ultimately, you all do that review. Um, if you all believe that there are issues with some of the recommendations made 
from the from the committees or from the advisory board, you kick it back. And that's why we have that arrow in between that back and forth. So uh, as you get these things or as these these ideas are formulated, then it's again as it's sent up to the city council, um, you all do public hearings. Uh, you get input from the citizens before you ultimately adopt the plan. And then hopefully we get to a point that you ultimately adopt the plan. And that's really where the process ends. And at that point is where staff then takes it on from there and starts working the plan as far as the recommendations and the goals and the objectives of this process. And so I just wanted to give you sort of a slight visual. I'm sorry that I'm not as articulate. I had a lot of help to put this, 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 this little graphic together because you just, you should have seen my original. It was pretty pathetic my original graphic because it was not that not not that attractive this is a lot more attractive and as you see there's public input and feedback along the way because that is commitment that we've made throughout the whole process and we will we will adhere to that all these meetings that we would have would be open to the public um, the committee meetings uh, obviously the planning and zoning commission meetings the um, um, the um, uh, the the main street uh, association board meetings would be open to the public and certainly the meetings that you all have here the city council open to the public. So I'm gonna I'm gonna advance the slide unless you all have any questions. Do you want questions on this slide? Or sure. Um, my question is um, where, or it's not my question, several people have asked this, where does the city's strategic priorities fit into this process? Because I know um, the three um, city council members who are currently uh, who, who were from the last uh, city council had expressed an interest in taking those to the public um, to, you know, add or to modify or whatever. Will those priorities just th as is be adopted to start this process or how will that work? Well, I'm sorry, <clears throat> what would be as is? or The strategic priorities that yeah. were voted on by the city. Right. Well, I mean, that, that's... Seven. Right, the seven of them. Uh, well, I mean, we're utilizing those now for every agenda, just about every agenda item that you have before you. And so we would continue utilizing those uh, throughout the process unless there is an opportunity to change them from council if that's what you all want to do. So uh, I think all, all three of the people had asked to have these brought before the whole, before the public okay. to actually add to them or change them. And if we are going to be using them, I think we need to go ahead and have some kind of public discussion of the priorities and modification you know, because I can okay. see they'll be listed on this report. Okay. And well, I, I, I just welcome you ask the, the council and we'll be happy to do that if that's what we need to be doing. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's a policy direction that the council wants to do. And if we, uh, we can certainly go in front of the public and talk about these things uh, on those priorities. Um, and um, if we need to continue doing that, we can certainly do that. But I mean, at, at this point, those priorities have been adopted and that's what we've been using the last number of months. Well, I would like us to do that, to take it before the public, to add priorities or to modify them um, prior to being utilized in the comprehensive plan. So what would be the process? To get these to fulfill her request. Well, I mean, if we want to bring those priorities forward as far as get public input, we can certainly have public meetings about the priorities, uh, the the seven that have been adopted. And I apologize, I can't think them think of them off the top of my head, all of them. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, but they um, fall in line here into this process uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, I know there's been discussions about. Uh, historic preservation, and that's obviously key to our city. That's not something at any point in this conversation that we've had with any of the consultants, regardless whether it's DTJ or any of the consultants we visited with, historic preservation is not being diminished in this plan. It's just not. Well, it I, isn't. I think we really have to clearly set, uh, and that's just one of the priorities I think we really have to clearly set, but there, there are a few others that have been brought up, and, and I just... Uh, personally, I don't think it's good for a city to adopt priorities without then taking them to the public for comment and addition and clarification. I think that's part of uh, okay. a democracy, okay. democratic okay. process. And actually, I'm not saying it. I, I actually heard all of the city council members say that um, back in the, in the meeting when it was adopted. Mm -hmm. okay. so. 
Well, I mean, we can certainly take those to the community and have a meeting about that. Um, is that something that you all want to do before these plans are adopted? I mean, there are a number of priorities that fall right in line with this, like I said. Um, historic preservation has been a comment that it was made certainly at your ward meeting, council member, and... Um, it, it was a ward, uh, a ward meeting you're, you're speaking of, or...? Yeah, yeah, that I heard at your ward meeting. Um, and so, again, it, throughout the RFQ process, um, any of the conversations that we've been had, that we've had with any of these consultants, historic preservation was one of those, and it's not being diminished at all through this process. Um, you, you know, so, um, I, I, don't, I don't really know any other comments. What um, else we want to cover? <clears throat> I don't know if I should hold, I have questions or comments that could touch on, on that particularly, that I can hold okay. until later, or I can talk about it now. I don't really care. Okay, well, let me just get to the presentation, and we yeah. can come back, right? <laughs> so, and we'll come back to that. So again, uh, you've seen this before, but just with any committee um, that we have, um, whether it's a board or an ad hoc or a temporary or, or a committee. Um, um, and so, you know, it's about obviously regular attendance, staying engaged, um, being represented, a representative of the community, uh, staying engaged, uh, providing guidance, uh, review and make a recommendation on a number of plan elements to serve as host. There's some things that committee, those committee members will be able to open doors that certainly I can as staff or a planning staff can and certainly a consultant can because they're not from here. Uh, but, but they will serve as hosts. We hope that we can, they can go to various places, whether it's at different facilities that they may have, whether it's a church or, or school district or just whatever the case may be, just to be able to host these meetings. I think it's important that they, they help us in that regard. Uh, certainly to uh, recruit hard to reach populations beginning again because of the connections they have in the community and then at the end just maintain decorum and and and, and make sure that that things are going smoothly and, and with with respect as far as because things can get charged depending on who comes and who discusses and so it's just about again just maintaining sort of the peace throughout the process um, this is one of the areas that would be important to get some governance, or excuse me, not governance, but consensus from council, or at least some, some feedback, um, is to um, uh, appointing members, uh, uh, well, you appoint the members, but then the chair and vice chair. Now, normally what happens, and we can continue doing this, that those, those chairs and vice chairs are appointed within the committee process, uh, just because based on who can do it and, and who's willing to serve. Uh, my question really here is, if that's the case, do you all as council want to, as part of a, of, of a resolution, do you want to name those individuals as the chair and vice chair once the committee does its appointment, if that makes any sense? Is that important for you all to ratify that at, at a future meeting? And so just a question, point of question, it's not that you have to land on it, but it's just one of those questions. Again, the intent is that the vice chair and chair, the chair and vice chair are appointed within the committee but then you take it to the next level and the council just ratifies that, if that's important to you. Um, as mentioned, all meetings are open to the public. Uh, a quor quorum is a simple majority, again, if it's a 10-member ten member board, uh, you know, get to six, uh, so we can get started with business. Um, uh, we had talked about having council members serve on, on these committees. Uh, certainly want you all to serve as, as committee members, uh, uh, and I'll talk about the number but you all serving as resources and voting members um, because you all have the context of what's going on in the community. You have the ability, um, if we are allowed to proceed with this process, uh, you all have the ability to, to bring those conversations to council when there is a staff presentation or an update. You can convey, yes, we are going through this process, things are going swimmingly well, or things are going off the rail since we need to kind of regroup. It just helps kind of that, kind of keep, keep things on track. Uh, being a being a part of that uh, and then really one of the areas that was was in discussion with you all that I'd like to get some some help with is if a plan element comes to the committee uh, from a piece of input and I can't explain to what it is but just say a, a recommendation to to move something that's important for the comp plan based on or the downtown master plan based on input from the community and working with a consultant does the council want to see decisions or recommended policy items or elements on this process? Do you want to do it through consensus only? Do you want to do it through consensus only? Do you think it should just be a simple majority?
from from the committee, or do you want to do a, a two thirds vote? Uh, and I say vote two thirds vote of of the members that are present. It's just really, what's your flavor as far as your 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 wants, your desires, your expectation? I mean, it can go either way, but just it's helpful because one of the things we would bring forward to you if we go down this path is we would bring a resolution to ratify the names on the committee plus the governance so that, so that we have that information to the committee. They kind of have their marching orders and what the expectations are so they know exactly how to proceed. So I'm throwing that out as, as just feedback. And then um, as mentioned, the final drafts would be forwarded, kind of the graphic, the final drafts would be forwarded to the advisory board, whether it's the Planning and Zoning Commission and their Main Street Board um, for their consideration. And then at the end, once this all is completed, in other words, when you all, if you all adopt either one or both of those plans, in theory, the, the, the committees end. They, they sunset. There's no reason to continue that process because they've, they're, they've completed their work. And they're, they're, they're done. And then we move on to, to other things. Um, here's the committee makeup. Uh, it's changed over the last few weeks or months. Uh, the only difference you've seen some of these uh, board reps and and uh, and also to uh, members from the community. The only difference that I added was the potentially of adding up to two council members per committee. In other words, would two of you want to serve on a downtown master plan, and would two of you want to serve on on the comprehensive land use plan? And that's really it. Is just to add that continuity. Uh, to that um, and allow you all to participate uh, and still uh, meet the needs of, of the committee and again as a resource because I think it's important to have uh, council members present on these committees as I mentioned that these would all be open to the public and and ultimately council would appoint these members the following is a list of folks um, that you all had recommended to serve on the Comprehensive Land Use Committee. I don't need the I don't need to read the names. You can read it there for yourselves on the board um, or on the the computer. But but uh, but you do see that representation from the community, and then also some representation from SFA and ISD, Planning and Zoning Commissioner, and an EDCO rep. Um, and then and again, as I mentioned, the only Excuse me, the only difference was having up to two members on city council. And then the downtown plan, um, again, you can see who, who you all have recommended. Um, and then again, no, no one's been appointed yet, just all recommended names. And then up to two members serving from council. The only thing that, that's a little slightly, that's slightly different, it's just a recent change, is on the convention and visitors board representative. Um, before the CVB, Board chair was John McLaren. Those that has just recently changed within the last two or three weeks. It is now um, Shay Runnels is the C, is the CVB board chair, and so and I I've spoken to Shay just a little bit about that, and uh, I've not spoken to John at all. And so really the other question is, do you want me to go reach speak with John and say, hey, you know, really the intent was to bring the board chair of that board, and so would you be okay if if we worked with Shay and then. Do you, and, and, you know, that's just, again, it's just a recent change that just happened within the last uh, couple of weeks. So really the next steps and discussion from you all is just kind of how do you want to set the direction on these committees? Uh, you know, do you want to pre proceed as presented based on some of the feedback points that I need from you about do you, is it okay that the, that the two committees choose their chairs with, from within and do you want to ratify those chair and board chair uh, chair and vice chair um, uh, names and then how do you want to proceed with moving things along through a consensus through a simple majority or two-thirds or more of a super majority uh, and then do you want to do add two additional do, do two council members per committee and if so who could those people be um, if you all are okay with that I just need to need some feedback on that um, and then um, the next steps would be is present the names and do a resolution for you all at the December 7th meeting. That would be after the discussion regarding the, the contracts. And um, if we proceed with that, we would notify those, those who had been selected and obviously those that weren't, we would let them know, um, um, for, thank them for their service, and then we would start to work with the committees. That's all I have. Okay. Um, we do not actually take 
action on this item tonight, but uh, I, I would like to have uh, any public comment regarding the uh, committees, uh, certainly. Can you come to the front? I guess I can. I'm not that old. I'll tell you. <laughs> the oldest one in the room, Melissa. Uh, Commission, I would like to say that I'm here as the president of the Federation of Women's Clubs, and if you're not familiar with that, we represent 600 or more women in town, and I'd like to encourage you to put some of those ladies on your committees for looking at the plan, the master plan, or the comprehensive plan either. We have some very qualified individuals that are members of the clubs. We represent 21 clubs in town. I think we might have one or two men that belong to one of the clubs, but predominantly it's all women. And we have retired physicians, retired lawyers, PhDs, business women. So if you'd consider some of those ladies, um, we would be very pleased. And if you need names of some of them, Mayor, I can provide those to would you. Would you do that, okay. please? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. I'm sorry I didn't ask Ms. Shin for her name. Could you state your name, please? <laughs> I'm Brandy Cartwright, and I just um, wanted to encourage you guys to pick somebody who, um, for the committees who um, advocates for parks. Um, I did not put my name in the, <laughs> in the thing because I was busy over the summer, but, um, but I hope that somebody on the, the board is um, interested in parks and, and what those do for our community. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, yes, sure. Come ahead and state your name, please. Hi, my name is Aaron Heidel. I was wondering if you could have some students and stuff represented in some of the committees to make sure you get the younger vote in. SFA students, I assume? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I didn't come for this one in particular, but yes, here's State my question. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Pat Costello, 1009 Logansport. I'm always worried about three minutes. Um, the question I have <laughs> is that we talked about a strategic plan. We're talking about committees. But yet, w what is the date that we're supposed to vote to make this comprehensive plan a reality? The, the day that the contract will be presented is December the 7th. So, and, and it's also on that day that we would vote to formulate these these committees. And it's not really the committees I'm concerned about. It's I, I'm not sure I understand when we were talking about the strategic planning. And that, so now that's a sep that's a separate issue. The, the the plan that we vote on December the seventh is the uh, whether to move forward with the contractor for the comprehensive plan and the downtown plan. But isn't the strategic planning? That, that's that's a that's a separate issue. That's just something that came up tonight that that we'll have to that we'll discuss further. Okay, because again, uh, there has been so much discussion and discourse regarding various things, particularly historic things. So that's my confusion level. So the committees are appointed after the group is there, hired there, to do the comprehensive there, plan. There'll be two things voted on December the seventh. I don't know the order. Okay. One would be selecting the committees, and then the second would be, or, or the other would be voting on whether or not to hire the contractor to do okay, the Okay, thank you, because I was not clear on that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, council. Ms. Fisher. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a question. I agree that that graphic was really beautiful that people help you put together. Uh, we'll pass that on. <laughs> um, but it confused me. Uh, there was one part of it that confused me a little bit. Can we go to it? Sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm like Ms. Costello, actually. I'm trying to wrap my brain around a little bit around timeline. Sure. Um, and the, the, this makes it seem like the committees don't really get engaged until later on, midway through the process. Is that actually is that is that accurate, or that was just for purposes of? of it's really just for illustrative purposes, because okay, okay. uh, it's just really hard to. And again, I'm not a graphics person to, to be able to superimpose different things. But right. a lot of it's working congruently right. together. Right. And, and so. Okay. Um, and so then. Regarding, 
regarding that timeline, what the mayor said was, so on December 7th, we'll vote on the contract and also on appointing the committees. Correct. And then if that sails through, what is the date that the project actually gets started? Well, you know, it, it's December 7th, so we'll have to get through the holidays. And so more than likely, it'll be after the first of the year. And okay. so I don't have an exact date yet. Um, just trying to work through some of the logistics of that. But but we would probably begin sometime after the first of the year to go ahead and get get everyone formula, you know, everyone, a, a, you know, trying to find dates to get everybody together and, and get started. I just don't have that. We will have that certainly for December the 7th, or I okay. can follow up and see if we've got an exact date, but I don't have that with me right now. Um, the, the reason that I ask is because I... I'm interested to know about um, how much lag time there's going to be. Um, some concern that we have heard is about needing more community engagement on the front end to get more community buy-in, mm -hmm. and it feels like this has been going on for months, and all of these months we could have been doing that. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and, and I mean, I get why we haven't been is because we've been trying to hammer this part out, but I'm wondering now about um, the lag time in between we, in between when council says, okay, let's go for it, and, and when the actual, actual work starts. And the reason is, is I'm wondering whether we can engage committees earlier on, like before the consultant shows up to town and starts doing their thing. Um, for purposes of community buy-in, maybe perhaps for purposes of, of, of the strategic priorities, if that's something that council um, wanted to, to get public input and buy-in from, um, is, is that a realistic it possibility? It certainly can be. Uh, I mean, we're, obviously it's November 2nd, so right. we, we can certainly, if you all feel comfortable, we can certainly bring uh, those committees to meet sooner, uh, but you know, until the council makes these appointments, at this point, it's just sort of answering questions occasionally. Hey, what's the status? Where are we uh, on this process? And it's we haven't brought in, we have not brought anything forward for you all to vote on. And if you all feel comfortable doing that, we can certainly put something on your um, November council mm -hmm. meeting. Uh, you only have another one, you know, the, your second meeting in November to to ratify these names in this process or whatever process you want to choose and, and start working with them. We can certainly do this informally and mm -hmm. reach out to them and, and, and get some input from them, whether it's through uh, email or we can bring these folks to the or you know, to the table, to the organization, and or meet with them at, at a location, whether it's at CBTX or the rec center or some other location to start working with these committees, knowing that they haven't been formally approved, but we can start working with them to try to get this input. I mean, I think one of the efforts that we'll be doing with this consultant is, is with it really with any consultant is, um, I mean, they're gonna get that kind of input. What is important to the committee, or excuse me, to the community? Are there things missing from the, the strategies that the previous council voted on, and if there are, it, obviously, that's going to be a part of the process. If it's something that's important to them is is uh, neighborhood integrity and and or neighborhood preservation, not necessarily just historic preservation, but neighborhood preservation, mm -hmm. that's going to be an important piece of that. I don't think any of those areas of input are going to get lost. Um, you know, if you look at our strategic plan, we, we you all crafted seven. And I say you all, the council at the time crafted seven. Uh, there are a number of things that that weren't necessarily adopted strategies, but are important mm -hmm. for the council. I would assume public safety is important for the council. That wasn't adopted as a strategy. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, financial stewardship or uh, 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 was is important. I mean, we have budgets, we have fiscal constraints, we have to work within our means. That wasn't adopted. So there are a lot of different things that I think uh, are just inherent in what we do right. that we're not going to lose sight of right. who we are. That is not something that's going to be lost. By this administration, being me and my staff, we are not going to lose sight that we are the oldest town in Texas. That is something that's near and dear to our community. It's baked in our history. It's not going to be lost sight of that. So we have to continue perpetuating the things that made us special, and we will continue doing so. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with with the city 
I mean, either alongside with or as this this contract um, process is moving forward. I don't have a problem with with staff hosting public meetings and hearings to, to discuss these strategic priorities. I feel pretty comfortable with them. I mean, they didn't happen in a vacuum. I, I agree with you, one, that, that none of this means that historical preservation isn't important. Um, and um, sure, it should be adopted as explicitly as a strategic priority. Um, but otherwise, I feel, I mean, I feel comfortable with the priorities that council set forth in that February meeting. Like I said, they didn't happen in 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 a vacuum. It's not like any, and I'm not saying that this is being this is the implication, but it's not like any of us showed up and said, "I feel like this is what I kind of want to do with it." And it's just, this is my own personal feel. I mean, it, it was done with a lot of thought and um, and 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 intention and speaking to our own communities and constituents about things that are important. And so I feel good about them. I think that it would be fine to host public um, hearings. I don't think that they necessarily, that we necessarily for those have to wait for this to get jump started. In fact, I think that it might be helpful to, um, in our goal to get some more community buy-in moving forward. Um, but yeah, I don't have a problem with those. And then um, I don't have any more questions, but just so that the council knows my take on the specific questions that you had, Mario. Um, on the, the committees choosing their own chair and vice chair, I, I, I'm internally, I'm fine with that. Um, ratifying, then bringing it to council to ratify. I, I, I guess that would be for the purposes of creating more accountability and, and, and weight to it, which I, I would be fine with. Um, and then your, your other question, well, adding the two council members, I think, is a good idea to each committee. And then your last one on the consensus versus two-thirds vote versus simple majority. By consensus, do you mean a unanimous? No, no, ma'am. But what do you it, mean? It's just, you know, consensus is that, that you, you, you reach consensus by, by trying to get at least all the pots on the table as best you can and try to get something that people can agree on. It may not necessarily be be unanimous, but, but people get around the idea that, that they can that they can ultimately uh, move an idea forward because they felt like they were heard, they understood where things were going, and, and they can get that, that buy-in. And, and again, they may not have gotten everything they wanted, but they got a lot of what they wanted in this process. Okay. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's just, it's how the chair facilitates the meeting, you know. And again, if there is just an issue that's very charged and it's just kind of a make or break kind of thing, it's how the chair or vice chair runs the meeting and says, you know, wh you know, what are your thoughts? It's no different than than you all when you all walk walk uh, work with with direction. You're not taking action. You're you're gaining some consensus around what does the majority of the council want to do on a specific issue, especially mm -hmm. when you're not taking a vote. Right. Um. I mean, I guess, so if we're talking about 16 and 15 people on each committee, that includes the two extra council members? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I feel like I would be fine with consensus or two-thirds probably would be where I would lean. Um, okay. But I, I actually don't feel, like, super strongly about it, and I'm open to hearing other people's opinions. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Um, I, I am also perfectly fine with, uh, revisiting in public form, not necessarily revisiting, but, uh, presenting the, the strategic, um, priorities that we have, have, uh, set forth in the past. And I, I agree that there are, um, certain overarching, um, priorities that are just inherent in this, in the community, like public safety and and uh, historic preservation. I I think you know if if they need to be said, then we can say them. But I don't think they need to be said really. <laughs> um, and now, not everybody is going to have the same priorities always, but uh, but I think those are are things that are um, so so obvious as to, to not necessarily need to be in print. But um, looking at the, the committee governance, um, I, I would tend to agree that I, I'm fine with, with a uh, consensus approach. Um, 
um, and if if we feel like we need a clear vote, um, I think a two-thirds vote um, would be the way to go rather than simple majority because there's there's too much room for for divisiveness with a, a simple majority I'm afraid um, on other issues you know as far as the committee governance I would I would almost you know it if the the sole purpose of council in in uh, cho the choice of chair and vice chair is merely to ratify the committee's choice itself, then I'm fine with that. I don't think that beyond council members being present um, on those committees, I don't. I, I think they need to have some some independence, um, some autonomy from council, um, and that uh, they they need to to choose their their leadership for themselves. Um, that's that's my take on it. Mayor, may, may I at least speak freely for just a second and maybe opine? My hope that it would not that again, if two members of council are present, that it, that it's not the council members that are the chair and vice chair because right, right. naturally committees tend to right. lean and, and on I, the elected. I think official. that that should be clear um, <clears throat> in in our governance is right. is that council members are are not. Um, eligible for those right. those positions on the committees, okay, thank you. Um, and and basically what I was saying was that um, you know that I, I think that choice needs to be made by the committees themselves okay. and not um, not council and the council needs to remain um, more in an advisory capacity on the the committees um, in my opinion anyway other than having a vote mm -hmm. on the on the committees. Okay, very good. And beyond that, that's all for me now. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bolden. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> On the, uh, the wheel, the pinwheel, <laughs> uh, I, was, I was a little disappointed that there was not more public hearing, uh, whether it's involved with the city council being there or with the committee th themselves. I would like to see more in okay. uh, We can de definitely hearing. do that. And as far as uh, the governance, the, uh, the size of the committee, and I think what the public is looking for is not what we have sit before us. Uh, there's probably quite a few more uh, that would like to be on the committee, which I, I really have no issue with, except that the larger your committee get, <laughs> let me just, for instance, dead cop. We have uh, 52 members on the dead cop board. And at first it was two thirds members to uh, have a quorum and establish vote. Well, we missed a lot of those because the larger your committees are, the less people show up. And so we now have it simple majority. So, but it's been stated by some of the citizens that we're missing out on some potentially uh, valuable assets okay. by not having their name on this committee. Okay. So. I mean, we can certainly add to it. Um, if you all see fit, we can certainly work with Ms. Shen and, and uh, uh, the, the lady that came and spoke about adding someone from the parks if we don't know. I mean, again, I don't know all the representatives and folks that are here. There, I'm sure some of them are park advocates, but I'm not certain if we need someone from the parks board or if we need someone from the trails community or, or, or someone from that that area, we can certainly. There, it's just really just how you all want to proceed. And don't forget SFA. That's yeah. okay. Well, we have a lot of representation from SSA, but yeah. certainly yeah. from the students' Not perspective. A student. Not yeah. a uh, can I jump in real quick? Okay, go ahead. You had asked about public hearings. Um, I just want to point out that the two public hearings that are on the flowchart mm -hmm. are those are requirements of law for those two bodies to act on the plan. Mm -hmm. And that trying to describe, it's not saying that's the only two times that the public will be 
asked to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, the public should be engaging throughout the process, and all of the meetings of the committees in a developing the plan should be public or open meetings, but nothing called as a public hearing and has a legal context and a legal meaning to it that I don't appreciate. I don't think that's what you meant. I think you just want to make sure the public was coming. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Well aware of everything that's going on. Right. And I, and I think that's what the process, those first three uh, parts of the pie are really an iterative process of getting the public engaged, having meetings about particular topics, and then getting feedback and sort of a back and forth going that then gets distilled to a plan that gets presented as a plan that has a public hearing attached to it, which has legal significance in the code. Okay. So I just wanted to be clear on what that was. Okay, thank you. On the two city council members. Yes, sir. Now, what is their purpose of being on the Really, just as a connection point, uh, okay. serve as a resource. Obviously, I mean, you all have you, you, you all represent large areas of, of the or, of the community organization, this community. Um, you all have um, obviously you're here. You hear what's going on. You see what's happening uh, on a regular basis for your agendas and what's coming from the from planning and zoning. You hear a lot of things from the community about the issues, and so really, it's that again, it's just that it extended of that connection point. Um, to serve on those committees to be a resource and to make sure that that if things are being bounced off that you hear what's going on you give input as to what you, you, you believe is kind of the wants and desires of the city council and again without fully representing them but you are representing them because you're your council members um, and, and, and again at the end it's just being a resource but not being such a resource that that it's dominated because again I'm, I'm just telling you I've worked with committees where there are council members, and not because I was an employee, I was serving on a, on a as a volunteer for a variety of whether it's bond programs for a school district or for other communities, and a lot of times when a council member or a board member of a respective ISD speaks, people listen, and and you all have a lot of sway and influence, and so that's great, but it's important I think to have that input from the committee members so they can speak freely and be able to participate in the process. Yeah, I just don't want the public. To think if we have two city council members on the comprehensive plan, that's the only two city council members they can go to for an input to be forwarded on. Right. right. No, I mean I think the intent is is if you know again if you all want to do that, and if you don't want to have anybody on council participate, that's fine as well. Uh, it was just an idea that was brought to the table. We've been kind of moving that along the last number of months, and it's just as an opportunity as a, as being a resource. Just going to add that you could have two of you participate without having to do all of the Open Meetings Act requirements of recording the meeting uh, at public notice and all of that. You're going to get lots of publicity for every one of the meetings, but it doesn't have to meet the statutory requirements for public notice. And that's why two is the max, because if mm -hmm. you have three, you've got a quorum, and we have to go through all of that. Yeah, but, but each the meeting is going to be put out to public notice anyway, right? They will all be publicly noticed right. and advertised, mm -hmm. and there will likely be a way of recording them, but it doesn't fall under the statutory requirements, and we don't get tripped up if we goof. Thank you. Uh, that's it for me, Mayor. Thank you. Oh, are you, are you yeah. Um, if we came in disguise, could we? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, so m we couldn't come to a meeting where the other two are present, even if we are quiet or whatever. It just did. God. That just well, and even if you didn't have any members and you all five showed up, I could only let two of you in. Wow. I mean, it's just, it's. I did have my Halloween costume. <laughs> So, so, so maybe non-voting members, and then we could we could sign up I to go. Or saying no. No, 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 no. I'm not saying I'll, just two of us can sign up to go. If all of you show up, no, 
no, or any number of no, you show up. just two of us could sign up to go. It would be limited to two of us signing up to go, and we're non-voters. So Kathleen and I sign up to go to the downtown plan meeting. The other three can't go. Is that okay? And then next time, maybe maybe Roy and Amelia sign up to go to that. You're that talking meeting. about circulating instead of having to assigned. be assigned. I think it's more helpful probably can, oh. to have some continuity, yeah. I think. Yeah, so you, it's, it's hard to, to right. focus on the task at hand if we're kind of right. rotating around in different and we didn't groups. Do it. So Okay. What your colleagues say is, is apropos, but there's no legal directive one way or the other. The only legal directive is only two of you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You, That's you, right. you continue. Um, so I, I wanted to, first of all, clarify about the strategic priorities. I, I'm not, I think you all had a very, very good, solid beginning, and I really appreciate it, and so do all the people who are asking questions about strategic priorities. But um, we did, I have, I happen to have in the Northeast Ward a very, very active group of people, and so they asked me to hold, they've been asking me a lot of questions, so I thought it was easier to hold uh, a meeting of the Northeast Ward, and this did come up, and we did talk about it. And there, are, I think there are some minor things throughout, and so there's some feedback that they'd like to have for, for the um, strategic priorities, and I think it's just really appropriate. And I love your idea of a little, you know, in between times, maybe there's a, a place to have that. Um, um, we could also forward some of the recommendations or hold another ward meeting to clarify some of the questions. It was not the, the basic, um, it was not the, the whole topic of the whole, um, but there were some very specific, you know, for example, like a downtown entertainment, what do we mean by entertainment? Can we also have something else in the downtown rather than entertain, you see what I'm saying? Just, just some clarifying things. So I think it'd be really, really appropriate to go ahead and and have a meeting, and people will feel much more engaged if they can participate in the priorities. That's a that's a big uh, issue for them. Um, as far as consensus, I I really liked your explanation of consensus. I thought that was very very helpful, and I just wanted to add a piece to it that when the philosophies consensus is more of a process. I think you described it very well. It's a process rather than like a vote. And um, so when we work with consensus, if there's an issue, for example, when we were discussing, um, I think, uh, Mayor Mize, you brought up maybe we could do things in sequential order, and, and then um, Mr. Bolden, you brought up a, another contractor that was recommended, but in, with consensus, then each of those issues would have been discussed to have consensus around uh, do we do it sequentially or do we do one big contract? Do we look at this contractor? So in consensus, you, you might peel off an issue. Does that make sense? So if, there, if we can see there, there's a, an issue of concern, you might peel that one off and say, maybe we should focus on this street. What do we think about this street? What do we think about um, the preservation and, and a renewal of um, some of the streets that have been designated as historic for some of our uh, communities, um, specific communities. What do we, uh, Shawnee Street I'm thinking of, and you know other things like that. You could peel that off and then pull it aside and then bring consensus around that. So that's why, I don't know if I'm making myself very clear, but I do appreciate a consensus approach sure. so that things aren't just folded in and moved forward when there are concerns. Absolutely. There are a lot of times that it, so you have 10 issues and eight are slam dunks and you're kind of able to get through that pretty quickly. You focus on the last two that are that are the more difficult issues to discuss and you, you may dwell on that for a while and, and work through the issues until you get the consensus you need to move it forward. And I think it's, it, thank you, that's that's very helpful. And I think it's 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 helpful to us as a city council to find the areas where there was not consensus and for us to think through those areas ourselves as a council and 
you know, maybe the committee can deal with 99%, but then there's a 1% that is really tricky that we might have to work on on something. And, and, I mean, to me, that's where our participation on the committees, our presence there, yeah. lets us come back and inform all of council right. Right. Um, right. On, on those issues that, that maybe don't have that full consensus that we'd like to see. Precisely. Yeah. Great, great way to put it. You put it much better than I did. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> as for the committee makeup, I, I have heard from a number of people that we really should have the Bright Foundation represented. And so I would like to see the Bright Foundation represented both on the downtown, because they've done a whole lot of work downtown, but also on the major comprehensive plan because they've done work throughout there. So I would like to see that. Okay. And I'd like to see a representative from the Federation of Women's Club knowing that this does add to the committee membership, both on downtown and in the whole uh, comprehensive planning community. And then possibly the, uh, the chair of the Parks Advocacy League. I would rather see somebody who is a, a, a citizen volunteer rather than somebody, you know, on parks. Okay. Um, and while I love our students, I, I, and I agree, I think there was so much in the presentation about student input, I, and there were so many mechanisms to get student input. I, I felt uh, comfortable that um, if we go with that contractor, we will get quite a bit of student input. Yeah, and my concern with that is that students come and go, this is going to be a lengthy process, right. and we can't necessarily be certain and, that. And, and if I can address on the students, uh, and again, if I may, um, and, and again, on the on the comprehensive plan review, that's one of the reasons why we have, if you see the SFA, SU rep, Carrie Charlie, and I don't, well, I don't know Mrs. Charlie, um, um, my understanding is she's got that, you know, she does work closely with with uh, the president's office, but also with students through, I think, I believe it's over auxiliary services, which is uh, the, the dorms and the um, um, uh, cafeteria, the, those auxiliary services. So I think able to kind of work in that area and, and pull students to bring, hey, we're going to be on campus, or they're going to be on campus getting input, so is there a way to, to garner support, whether it's at the student center or some other places to, so again, I think we can get to that input, but if, if you are all looking for student activity on, well, on the, these committees, I'd be happy to do that. But to like me, the, the consultants seem to have a pretty good grasp on the need for student input and, yeah. and the need for that involvement in the process. I actually disagree. Um, I'm not that the consultant had a good grasp on it, but I think that you could use that explanation for literally every um, segment of this community, you could say they had a good grasp on really engaging X community, so we don't have to include them in that committee. And so I, I, I actually don't think that that's a good reason to to have yeah. a student off. I also think that you can put someone on there who isn't going to, you know, who isn't about to graduate and move, right? Like the <clears throat> student body is very organized, and um, um, they have they have student government, they have. I mean, a lot of clubs, and so I remember in college being super involved and super organized and together, and I think that there would be a, not a difficult way to find a student to put on the committee, on each committee, and I think that it would be important. I think that if we're already talking about adding somebody from the Bright Foundation and if we're already talking about adding somebody from the Federation of Women, that I think that the SFA students should have a chair, too. One other, uh, one other thing. That's okay. Stage. That's all right. Um, instead of sunsetting these committees, I think it might be wise um, to keep them, partly because we're very concerned with implementation, and mm -hmm. so I would rather not see them uh, uh, um, having, you know, sayonara, you know, but but keep them. Okay. It, would there be an expectation that that they meet periodically to yep. update? Okay. okay. And, and, and they could transform, too. They, we they need it. I think so. Yeah. I think we need that accountability okay. for implementation. I think that's a, it, that's a great idea. Would it be okay? And, again, I'm not trying to – I don't disagree. We can certainly do that. 
um, when we get towards the end is, is I mean, because people may get tired and just ti are done <laughs> themselves. And so can we, and especially if we're losing students because, again, they're, they're transitioning out, could we come back to the council to figure out how we have sort of a, an oversight committee, if that makes sense, of these mm -hmm. plans as, mm -hmm. as opposed revisit to. Revisit it later. Yeah, that's we what I'm saying. Revisit any of these things. Right. right. Different but skill set that, you know, someone has on that group, yeah. But I think we need that. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, and, and it's not just accountability, it's implementation is hard. <laughs> so it needs all, it needs us to implement uh, um, some of these things require a lot of funds or require grant writing or require um, some substantial um, uh, collaboration. So that is a good part. So I, I like community engagement. Absolutely. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I think that's, I have notes everywhere but I think that covers it okay any anyone else so, so just as just yeah. as a recap okay. that way I'm not missing something um, as far as and I'll go back here pardon my back and forth here so um, everyone's good with the committees themselves obviously picking their their chair and vice chair and they'll come back to council at some point pretty quick um, obviously meetings is open to the public uh, con Quorum, in other words, getting the groups to actually meet and conduct business, a simple quorum uh, is just a simple majority um, um, to conduct business. Um, um, you all feel comfortable with consensus to move an issue forward on, on, on the on the on, on these committees, and uh, certainly, uh, and again, we can certainly when we get to that process, we can talk about what does consensus mean and how do you get there. Just the just the explanation of what that is. Again, not to belittle anyone's intelligence, but just to make sure that consensus doesn't mean that we have to unanimously vote. I mean, there's some things that we can move forward and some things we might need to dwell on for a while until we get there, if that's okay. Just wanna make sure. Um, and then uh, we mentioned about not sunsetting, but maybe revisiting that and maybe uh, more fit. We'll, I'll talk to Mr. Kirkland, I'll see how we can make that happen, how it gets revisited as far as uh, implementation and oversight. Um, I heard uh, of potentially adding four additional people per committee. Is that correct? So if, if I heard correctly, the Federation of, of, of Women, uh, uh, a Parks Advocate League person represented the chair or someone in that in that parks arena, and I can work with Brian Bray on, on one of those two individuals. Um, I heard the... I, I, I would rather... Um well, well, first of all, uh, my recommendation was not to have a Parks Advocacy League person downtown, but maybe we should. Um, it, but I would rather the Parks Advocacy League choose their member. Does that make sense? Sure. Rather than... But you want that person, you want that rep group represented on the comp plan, not yes. the downtown. Yeah, I mean, that. yes, definitely for the comprehensive okay. plan. And possibly downtown, but I... I wasn't thinking that when I made that recommendation. But I do think the, for example, the Bright Foundation should choose who they want on, uh, to, to re be represented on both sure. those committees. And um, the Federation of Women's Club should choose who they want on both those committees. Okay. Rather than us choosing a representative from them. No, I would go with your room directly and just see who they'd like. And then, um, or one of you can, however you all would like for me to do that. And then, didn't I hear as two SFA two SFA student reps. You probably need to talk about it. Both. Uh, Do you think comp in downtown? Probably. Yes, I think I yeah. think so. Yeah, okay. we're gonna, yeah. If we're going going to have direct representation, yeah. then I, I think one on each. So it looks like we're adding four people to the comp plan, and potentially three, maybe four people to the downtown plan uh, on the parks. Advocacy component, correct? Just want to make sure I heard that correctly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think if we're going to go to these groups, I, I think Let them participate there are both. enough things that apply on in both okay. arenas. Perfect. That, that makes it know. easier. Mm -hmm. That makes it easier. Yeah. And then, as far as council members, who wants to play? Who wants to participate? Knowing that we're trying to keep two and two, so again, as Mr. Kirkman said, to to not make it an issue from an open meetings act component, but 
who wants to participate in these in these committees? So if we have to choose, obviously we have to choose. I think I'd rather do the larger comprehensive plan. How, I mean, how do you want to do this? Are you asking yeah, so us to give, to say where we want to be? Do you well, have? Well, I, I mean, I have my ideas just mm -hmm. because of what I know of you all. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't want to speak for you either, so. so. Well, I'm agreeing to what you suggested to me. Oh, okay. Two, um, a, a week, uh, two weeks ago, so just to clarify, that's what. I'm perfectly willing to do it. Um, if I were to choose, probably the comp plan, um, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to serve on, on either. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at the comprehensive plan. I feel like I'd be mm -hmm. more valuable to my community mm -hmm. as a whole <coughs> if I was on the comp plan. Good. Eight. Where, good. Wherever you want. Okay. Downtown. Yep. Okay. All right. And either or none for me <laughs> is fine. <laughs> I'll go eat wherever I need to be. You're our tiebreaker. So, all right. That's all I have. So we're looking bringing this to you all on December the seventh. Uh, we'll work with uh, our team on getting some, some maybe some meetings scheduled here shortly uh, on the priorities just to kind of a provide some clarity explanation. Certainly all these topics will be brought forward as part of the, the consultant's process to make sure that those things aren't missed. Because again, all those things are priority for us, whether it's public safety, finances, historic preservation, neighborhood. I mean, all those are inherent. Parks, I mean, we didn't even touch on quality of life, some of the quality of life issues, and those are important and important for all of us. But, but that's the intent of those pro strategies and those priorities, and we'll continue making those a major focus. Yes, ma'am. Um, These opinions that I've just given does not mean that I don't have concerns, serious concerns, about um, the entire comprehensive plan, including the things I mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to clarify that. Understood. All right. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and then uh, and then we're good with making sure everyone's good and, and getting with Shay Runnels to instead of John just because of the. Very good. Thank you all. Okay, we will move on to D. Receive a report, hold a discussion, and give staff direction on purging uncollectible fines and cases. City Attorney Kirkland. Uh, good evening, guys. I know uh, the Astros are either about to start or have started. Have. Have. 709. So I will try to be as brief as I can while giving you the information I need you to have. Um, and I also want to tell you I'm not asking you to vote on anything tonight. This is a, by way of a report to tell you what, what I'm doing. Uh, and it is part of an ongoing process that Judge Watts and I have engaged in in finding and bringing best practices and best uh, well, best practices in making sure we're current with the law in the municipal court operations. If you recall, a couple of months ago, I brought you a contract called the Scofflaw contract, where we added another tool to our tool belt of collections. Um, another thing that happens in the collecting municipal court fines, fees, cases, is that periodically the old stuff gets chunked, gets tossed off. Um, and there's lots of reasons behind that. Uh, and I'll start with simply just explaining how you get a, a warrant issued uh, in municipal courts. There's two possible ways it can happen. One is you either agree to or are ordered to pay a fine and you don't. And that's a type of warrant that's known as a capious pro fine, which allows a police officer to go out and take you wherever you happen to be found and put you in jail until you have paid off your fine. Um, it is a way of adding teeth to fine only offenses, but for municipal courts, it is always starting with a fine, and the legislature and the entire body of law says these are things that are important, but they're not important enough to lock you up in the first instance. They're things that are just used as tools in making sure we're getting your attention, and that's what the fine is all about. Um, I know whenever we talk about money, 
uh, in the context of anything the city does, that means we're going to generate a number. It goes on a, a balance sheet. It goes in a budget. And that becomes a driving force in discussions about those operations. And this is the one area where you have to not do that. This is all about public safety, and the money is part of making sure that the programs that are implemented through there are effective and have some T's to get people's attention. This is all about creating public safety. So one way you get it is through this KPS profile. The other way is where you're told to show up in court and you do not. Uh, and that's called a failure to appear warrant. Uh, the KPS profile means that the process is essentially complete and all that's left is collecting the money. A failure to appear warrant is the process hasn't even begun yet. So that if you are picked up on a failure to appear warrant, you are taken before the judge and you are told what you're charged and you enter a plea and you have a right to have a trial, which puts me to work doing fun things like you know, finding witnesses finding the law and making sure we're prepared to prosecute a case. Um, that is really fun when it's fresh and new in everybody's mind. It's great. It's also really effective in driving public safety when we can focus on the stuff that's new. Um, studies from all the various justice organizations out there are that the holding someone accountable for their actions in closest closest to the time that they have done those actions is the most effective way of changing their behavior if that's what the goal of the program is. And that's what the goal of our program is. So we want to be able to focus on the stuff that's fresh and new, not the stuff that's old and stale. Um, so you get a KPS profile, you have your initial appearance, you, you enter your plea, you get a KPS profile, or you don't show up. It goes to warrants. Warrant is a tool for collections and getting people's attention. Uh, that requires sending a police officer out to grab <coughs> the person or apprehending the person somewhere along the way in their day. Uh, most municipal court Class C warrants are actually served or collected when officers encounter a defendant again. So you fail to show up for your last speeding ticket, you get stopped for the next speeding ticket, chances are the officer will be able to take you directly to the court rather than giving you a citation and telling you to show up. Um, those are possibilities that, that, that come into play, but the threat of being dragged off out of your day is an effective tool for collection. Um, so that's one. That's the next step. If the warrant isn't served on someone, then at some point, this is, I think we're at 90 days, we refer the case to a collections agency who then engages all the various search devices to help try to find them, uh, and then sends them letters uh, and advises them, there's a warrant out for your arrest. You need to come take care of this. So that's for the people who are like me, absent-minded and forgetful, and need reminders. Um, I also need people to call me and tell me to go to places. You all have witnessed. I need Jan to tell me when to show up here. Um, so that's the next step, is the warrant, then the collections agency, and there's phone calls from court staff, as well as now we have a part-time bailiff who is also making phone calls to collect on warrants. Your next step then goes to, we report it to something known as Omnibase, which is the central data system for the state of Texas. It puts a hold on a person's ability to renew their license until they address the warrant. So they either have to come pay their fine, if it's a KPS pro fine, or they have to appear in court and make another promise to appear and then follow through on that process. The holds in Omnibase don't get lifted until the warrant is resolved. Um, and that would catch anybody that is engaging in getting a driver's license should catch them within seven years because that's the cycle is every seven years. Then the last thing that happens is the scoff law. The last piece that we've added to that is the scoff law program, which we brought to you a couple of months ago, which allows us to report it to a database that puts a hold on their registrations. So people that are renewing their registrations on their car, which we have to do every year, uh, they get told that they have to come deal with their warrant before they can do that. So these are the steps that we use to process uh, and, and collect on 
uh, warrants. Um, by the time you've gone through the omnibase cycle, the seven years, you are pretty much at the point of determining that this person is either not findable or has dropped out of the system in such a way that they're not being encountered again, or they've left the jurisdiction and they're no longer in our community. Uh, and so the idea of keeping a case around against someone who's no longer in the community is just simply dead weight on the system and we need to get rid of it. Um, many cities go through periodic purges. They'll go through a, what's called a warrant roundup, which has many different forms. Uh, sometimes it's actually officers going out door to door, knocking on, on places. That's not been the recommended course of action for some time, but it used to be. And then once they've gone through and done something through the warrant roundup process, they make a determination that the people that they hadn't found are not in their community anymore and are no longer something we should carry in our system. In the last legislative session, not this one, but I think the one before this, the state actually adopted a statute allowing uh, courts to uh, just simply declare that any capious profile that's been outstanding for more than 15 years uh, can be declared uncollectible, and those can be purged from the system. So what we are doing is that uh, is something that hasn't been done in our system for a long time, and none of the folks that I've talked to can recall it happening in our system, is we are taking those old cases and we're purging them from the system. So anything that is over 15 years old in terms of a KPS profile uh, is being purged from the system and declared uncollectible. And anything that is over 10 years old on a failure to appear warrant is going to be purged from the system as well. So that's what's going on, and that's the process that you're going on, that uh, we are beginning. Uh, this will show up at the end of next year on the financial report with a write-off number. Um, and I don't want you to focus on that number because that number was never real anyway. I mean, even with KPS Pro fines, people have agreed to pay a fine. Whatever has happened, they haven't paid it. The way many places those fines get paid off is where people just go and spend the night in jail and the case gets reduced by their time in jail. Um, that's not a particularly effective way of doing anything, uh, and it's certainly costing you money to collect on something. You're not getting any money in the end. Uh, and so that's, what's, that's what we're doing, uh, and I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to hear it directly from me. Uh, with respect to the failure to appear fines, uh, warrants at 10 years, my memory, of course, is not good for yesterday, but uh, at 10 years, it, it really is pushing the limits of people's memories to, to give credible testimony. Uh, and your officers do a really good job of taking good notes so that they have things to refresh their recollections. Um, but I also have to have the officer that wrote those notes to prosecute that case. And you've had a great deal of turnover. So we selected the 10-year level because we felt that gave the full cycle of possibilities to get these folks in the system uh, and a little bit of fudge. So that's why we picked the 10-year number. So that's happening uh, when people start asking you questions. That's what it's about. It's so we can get rid of the stuff that is dragging on the system and focus on what is current, real, that will make a real impact in our community. Okay. Any any comments? Any any questions? Thank you for taking the initiative yes. to do this. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds very reasonable. All right. Is, is, is like a Class C warrant, is that put into a database? And how far does that database spread out? So the database for Class C warrants is in the state. It's a state, state? system and it's okay. only statewide. Um, and uh, not all of Class C warrants go into this database. It is, uh, or any Class C offenses go into this database. It's only driving records mm -hmm. that are collected in the state database. So people's records, no matter where they are or what they are, do not include Class C misdemeanors. Okay. The driving record does include your driving infractions, which is a subset of Class C misdemeanors. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank Anybody you, else? Mayor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move forward to E. Consider right. approval of a public forum public comment policy for city council meetings. City Attorney Kirkland. So the last time we talked about the public forum and public comment policy, we had a lot of discussion about the, the legal environment in which you operate in which this had to be structured. And we tossed around a lot of good ideas, a lot of ways to structure uh, your public comment policies. Um, and Ms. Vincent and I have taken all of those comments, distilled them down to the document you see before you. I think most of those you reached consensus on, and I believe that's reflected here. There is one point that we didn't get consensus from you on. Did you pull it up, or is that, or do we just need to pull it up on our own? Uh, I. Okay. Uh, if you if you were not happy with the uh, well, if you were happy with. Mario's graphics, that's great. I don't have all the people to help me make mine pretty. <laughs> I've, got, I've got it. Okay, yeah. Mark, I was going to try to pull it up. It's okay. I've got it. Yeah. I, I'll, I'm um, so the one thing that we didn't get a consensus from you all was on the length of time to put people to. Um, and the two options that I had laid out for you last time were continuing with the three minutes and stretching it across all public comment. Or um, I suggested that you could also do a different level of uh, a different length for uh, open forum and then public comment sessions for the stuff that's actually being voted on. Um, there's reasons to do it anyway. Any either way, there's reasons to. Uh, you can justify all of them, and it really is a question of what's your pleasure and what's your flavor that you like there. Um, the feedback that I've been getting recently is that you all like the three minutes and you want to put it across the board. Um, I just need to hear you say that's what you want when you adopt this policy. I see a nod, Jay. I mean, Ms. Anderson. Uh, it depends on the context, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to go along with that. Okay. Mr. Bowden. I am for the three minutes for the open forum. But in the public hearing section, three minutes may not be enough, but it would be up to the mayor to say, you know, you're being repetitive or whatever. But so built into the comment guidelines here is uh, the mayor does have the authority to ask people, give people time to wrap up right. or to ex invite you all to vote on extending the times. And I think I had a discussion with Councilmember Bellinger a little bit earlier. You, as a body, always have the option of asking for a vote to extend time. Um, but it has to be voted on. Yeah, once you adopt a policy, mm -hmm. if you want to do something different than policy, you have to vote, yes. Uh, the reason to have time limits is so that you're a communicating to your public, A, we're going to hold you to this so that everybody that wants to talk has a reasonable amount of time to talk, but we're also going to keep the, keep the meeting moving. Uh, and it gives you the tool to do that. Otherwise, you rely on Femi's charm, which is you know, substantial and quite <laughs> capable of many things. But you know, he probably should be given the, all the tools that he, we could give him. Thank you. So, so one of the questions was, um, uh, there were a couple of questions that I thought were, were really um, important. And one was if um, somebody had a little bit lengthier comment, could, could somebody else give them their time? And uh, I thought that was a, an interesting thing. So if ahead of time, if somebody said, I'd rather this person speak for me a little longer, could they have their time? And I think that's interesting. And then I'll go ahead and throw out the second one. There may be times when um, there needs to be um, a presentation about something a lot more complex. And um, rather than vote on it, I mean, can any council member put it on the agenda and then say there is a present? And I'm thinking of things like right now, the Lan Lanana Creek is holding a hearing on the water safety. And, and if we wanted 
a, a presentation from not necessarily staff, but from people who were from Lonana Creek uh, who had been involved with this. I, I don't want them to have just a three minute. I don't know how that works or where that is. So this would not foreclose having planned presentations to council from outside bodies. You get that already. Okay. Uh, and I, I would expect that you would continue to get that. Um, it doesn't foreclose so you and the mayor asking that a thing be placed on an agenda for a presentation. Um, this is and so for, that wouldn't be limited to No, this okay. is not addressing presentations like okay. that. Okay. And then the other item, the pooling of time. Right. I think that was an issue that the previous council had, had allowed because there was a limit on the number of people who could speak. Mm -hmm. I think the previous policy, because I think Mr. Kirkland struck it out, says you can't donate. You right. cannot donate your. Wait, did did the did I make that up? Speaker's time may not be pooled or given to other speakers. Right. It seems like that was but the you, policy was yeah. to not pool. But you also I have, can't limit the number of speakers. We found through a. So, through an attorney's opinion, is that right? Right. You had previously uh, had a limit on the number of speakers, so sharing of a. Sharing time is perhaps more reasonable. Right. Uh, in this system where you're not limiting time and anybody can speak, deferring time to someone else doesn't make a whole lot of sense, particularly when you all have the ability to uh, ask that that person speaking time be extended. Um, but again, it is your preference and your policy that we're writing here. We didn't talk about that in the last time, so it's not reflected in this document. Um, it, so even though we can't put, a, because of the AG opinion, we can't put a limit on the number of people, would we be able to put a limit on the number of time pooled? Like say, okay, you can donate time, but it can't exceed X amount of minutes? Uh, you would be taxing your city secretary's that math seems like abilities. Very but, and she's very good, <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, I mean, no. Well, no. I believe um, that. I, I mean, in the in the same way that we were tracking before, five people to sign up for for open forum, you would track it the same way. It's just so. I mean, because I I heard about I've been asked also about pooling time or get or donating your time, and and one reason that I found particularly compelling is someone might want to say something about something, but they don't feel comfortable speaking in public. Um, and so they want to donate their three minutes to the person who, or if it's a particularly important issue, three minutes is really not a very long time. Um, and so, but I also understand the other aspect of it, which is, okay, well then, you know, like 100 people could pull, could donate their time to speaker number one, and then we're going to be here forever. So I don't, I don't support it without limits, but I wonder if there's a way that, I mean, like that. Practically speaking, you could say, okay, well, whoever's going to donate their time has to be physically present, um, and sign up. You know, sign up, and there's going to be a limit of. So, council member, if you've got an issue that takes that much time to mm -hmm. present, you should be calling a special presentation meeting to hear that issue. It should be on the agenda. Well, but then that would that puts the onus on the person to show up to open forum and within their three minutes request that council put it in a special presentation. They don't have to right. show up in open forum to ask you to create a special presentation. They can come to your office and talk to you and convince you that this is worthy of having a special presentation. Okay. And then you would take it to your colleagues to say we need a special presentation. Mm -hmm. It's I understand what you're saying. So I, there's ways to get all of that taken care of without, without it putting unnecessary, open, yep. putting all this process. I mean, you all have a role in representing the shy people, as well as the loud people, as well as the people who show up. Uh, and part of what you do is you tell us to bring you issues, flesh them out, and we do that. Um, I, a classic example, an easy example, is Logansport. Councilmember Bellinger has an issue with that and has a lot of things that need to be said, and she's asked that it be put on the council agenda, and 
we had put it on the council mm -hmm. agenda with a presentation for people to present. Um, Lenana Creek water, what is it, a water, watershed, watershed uh, water quality studies okay. and, and concerns would be another issue that would be significant in terms of understanding and getting the issues before mm -hmm. you. Um, and it would be worthy of a presentation. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So just because open forum is not the only way that things get here. Right, right. <clears throat> um, uh, so notwithstanding all, all your comments right. that were very insightful, I, I do like the idea of being able to ask somebody to speak for you and donating your time, um, e e and particularly on things that are on our agenda. Um, I, I think it's fair to limit it to just one, you know, one donation of time or something. I think that because there are people who would rather somebody else speak. I'm, I'm amazed at some of the people who are very, very, care very, very much, but are afraid to speak about people I would never have imagined. But um, it's it's not easy standing up in public and talking. No, I know, but and, but but uh, but and also I think there may be um, something that somebody is, is much more technical, and and they might like to present that. I don't think it hurts too much, and maybe if I don't think it'll ever get used, but you know, but I, I kind of like the idea of uh, you know at least donating one go round to to give some time. But I, I'm not wed to it. I mean, so uh, the issues would be limit taking the three minute versus the one minute on uh, on open forum, yeah. and then the other would be: Do we want to consider allowing right. one person to donate their time to another person for a maximum of six minutes? Right. Yeah, that, I'd be okay. okay. With that. Do, do I have a motion to that? I okay. so move. I have a motion from Ms. Bellinger. Do I have a second? I'll second that. <clears throat> second. Ms. Fisher, uh, any discussion? Okay. Those in favor? Of oh, I'm sorry. I got the card ahead of the horse. Absolutely. We need public comment before we did our discussion. I apologize for that. Okay. Let me be clear on this. I know that the citizens, whatever we do in the beginning, three minutes, right? We've agreed on that. Where I'm not clear is are we talking limiting agenda items to three minutes yes public comment deals with agenda items yes and so that would so be the public's comment in in, in relation to an public agenda comment uh -huh. okay so now since there will be a meeting and i will have a lot more than three minutes that i'll need so therefore are you talking about logansport street oh no i would never be talking about logansport <laughs> street if you're um, talking about Logansport Meet Street, there's special so rules. So all I have to do is ask my, my council member, this is my council member, my wonderful council member, and um, they will have the right to grant me enough time to make my presentation. Is and, that what I just heard? And, and, I, and actually, I meant to modify my uh, motion beginning December 1st. And, but but I need an answer to, to what I just asked from maybe the city attorney. So, so uh, I'll let you answer. But. The question was, if you want to speak for longer than three minutes on an agenda item, I'm going to have to say, hey, everybody, can we let her speak more than three minutes? And was then the they'll question? vote on this? And then we vote on it? Or I don't think that's very democratic. Or six minutes. Or I'm what? a little concerned about that. What do you think we should do? Our I'm not minutes. sure, but I think in certain issues, mm -hmm. and there are various issues, and my particular issue, I've done a tremendous amount of work, but um, there's no way you can get the whole thing out in three minutes. Right. So I think there has to be some fluctuation here, and I don't know how you address that. Because um, there, most items, yeah, you can get rid of in three minutes. Mm -hmm. Comprehensive plan was one where, you know, people probably took two hours, but there's certain issues require more time from people, people who have done a lot of research, people who have done a lot of work. And it's not just my particular issue, but there are other people with similar issues. I mean, I'm already in trouble having been clocked uh, on three minutes before. So there's no way certain things could be done in three minutes. Also, like I've seen various people come here and make presentations and things like that. 
And just like you said, sometimes just the technical things are going to take more than three minutes. So how do we resolve this? What would, um, I understand the point and there has to be a balance between, the, I mean, is your suggestion for, for there to be no limit? Well, I understand that there are those that just never shut up and just to hear themselves talk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that balance is made. But I also think that there are those that have valid mm -hmm. presentations or whatever you want to call them. And I don't think that they should be limited to three minutes. So maybe uh, it, before they can be told that you, you go to the city secretary or something and ask, this is going to take X amount of time. May I have that time? Not trying to bribe the whole membership to give me three minutes, three minutes, three minutes. Right. And I, I've seen meetings like that where you do that. You know, it, it's a game. And um, I, I just think there needs to be a little more fluctuation here. Um, because I think I'm being, I, I when I say I, mm -hmm. I'm standing for the citizenry. I think I'm being restrained by the council. Okay, so would there be a way, a mechanism by which we could say three minutes is the standard rule, but if, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to so think about like a procedural fair. Council Member Fisher, that is the presentation meeting. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. But I don't but think that, that she's giving the, presentation but there there are there could be more than one presentation oh, like it would be a presentation okay. and then her she has a public comment that isn't a part of the presentation well my public comment is, is a your presentation. presentation so those issues that are that technical or in depth that require that much discussion should have additional meetings devoted just to that whether it be a workshop where you all workshop it and take comment as long as you want any way you want or a special presentation where people are lined up to speak on the issue, to present the issue, the technical aspects of it. Those are things that you plan for in advance. If it comes up that there's an issue that requires that, you all have it within your authority to say, pull this one from the agenda, even as we're having the meeting, saying we, wanna, we want a special meeting on this. No, I, I don't think that's what I'm asking. Well, it is what you're, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. What, what, I'm, what I'm asking is that, and in specific, on November 16th, you're supposed to deal with Logan Sport Street. There are at least four people that have made presentations that are valid presentations. They're not just people talking off the top of their head. And that's going to take more than three minutes. And so how do we do that? Those people are not limited by the three minutes. So that's the presentation that's my, meeting. That's, that's my concern, but, but forgive me for my ignorance because I'm a little confused on this one. So you can do that at the council meeting. Council has asked for that for that issue. And when council asks for an issue to be explained and have a full presentation, that's what you get. At the council meeting. So, so let, let, me, let, let, me, let me clarify a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, there is a presentation that um, is going to be, um, you know, presented. And there, what, what Ms. Costello is saying is there are a, a, a one or maybe more additional presentations from individual people. I don't know how many there are, and I don't think it's fair to impose our rules, whatever we're saying now, um, it, because people have been working toward this for a long time. So whatever it, we adopt, I'd like to do, adopt it beginning December 1st, because I don't know uh, what exactly people um, have. There will be a, one large presentation, and, um, uh, and people have not been told they've been, they need to limit or whatever. Well, right, right now, the rule is three minutes. Not, not on an agenda not item. Not on the agenda items. On, mm. on public comment, it's, it's not? Mm. No, it's not. not, not, not. No, no, they have a time limit on the agenda. There is no time limit on agenda. I mean, in fact, you can go to 30 minutes as chosen, you know. But, pe but people, I think, will be, you know, very thoughtful. They're not going to just, you know, talk for forever. Yeah, I was kind of <coughs> under the impression that as you brought this to the council, uh, that you would define the presenters. I'm not, I'm, 
I, my uh, pact was to um, get this on the agenda, that's what, um, and, and have a presentation that, um, that people would ask to have done. And then other people are, wa will want to speak. I am not running it. I am just the avenue for this to be, to be, um, um, to be presented to council. So, uh, I mean, okay. So the way that I, because we are very clearly talking about one issue, which is the right. Logan Sports Street. Well, meeting. no, I'm no, I'm talking issues. about one issue, but there are other issues that will rise to this level of importance okay. by other people. And so to say that the public forum only has three minutes puts you in handcuffs if you're going to make a, a valid a valid presentation. Um, well, that, that's where we need to have a separate either agenda item or meeting. Well, a separate meeting wouldn't and, and serve the can, same purpose. We can pull it that should in. be done Ms. at council. Ms. Costello, would you, would you let Mr. Anderson answer the question, yeah, it, please? It, you would still have a public meeting. It would just be a separate meeting, and that's on the on that issue. I, I if, heard if it that. rises yes. to that level, then we we separate it out and do it. And that's what I'm saying. I don't want a separate meeting. I want this done at council at council level. I mean, I've been with other councils in other cities it, it would and everything. Still be a council meeting. How is that possible? We'll just put it on a it, different. Am meeting. I correct, Mr. Let's, Kirkland? Let's yes. let's let Ms. Costello give us our comments, okay. then we can deliberate. Is there anything else that you'd you'd like to tell us? What I want to know is, how do we go and rise above the three minutes in response to an item on the agenda? Because there should be a vehicle that, if you can validate that you have something you wish to present that's going to take more than three minutes, you should have that right. And I would like to know what that vehicle is, and not another meeting or not another place or at the meeting that is taking place for that time. Okay. Thank you for your comments. We will deliberate further. No, no. I, I'm just concerned before you vote. Because if you vote for three minutes, then how do I rise above that? I understand your, but but this is not the appropriate way for us to discuss the issue. You give us your comment, and then we deliberate and 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 make a, a an effort to go forward. And it could involve pulling the motion all together, having uh, uh, Mr. Kirkland do some more work on it, and try to figure a better way. But but I mean the the way the this exchange is not appropriate in in the council meeting. You you make your comment, and then we deliberate and make a decision. Okay, but I'm just responding to what I just was told. Thank you. And we and we don't have a time limit yet on how long I'm allowed to do this, and that's my concern. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you. Well, um Mayor. Wait, we have one more. We have Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> hard for me to get here, so I want to say what I want to say. Sure. Um, oh, Vicki Linnell, Ellie Wincock Street. Thank you all for listening. Um, I think it's really important. You all just spent this item before this talking about community engagement. Turning open forum into one minute is the, is the worst thing you can do for public engagement. It's insulting. If my, if, if I have to race up here from Lufkin because I care so much about an issue that I want to talk to you and you give me a mere moment of your time, that's pretty insulting. And, and I'm not saying this to anyone personally because I'm shocked. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked that that would come from this council anyway because that's not who you all are. But um, also I want to say I've been in hearings where you were allowed to donate your time and I think that the benefit of that is it can streamline things because people aren't repeating the same thing over and over. You don't have the movement back and forth, and you can get a, a much a more uh, broad and deep view of the issue at hand. So I, I don't think it's always a game. I mean, everything, everything can be abused, but it can mm -hmm. also be a really good tool to streamline and get a better discussion. Um, and so I would like to uh, ask you to consider that and also to consider keeping the um, keeping it open, 
an open time on, on agenda items because we're here because it's important to us. But thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Brandy Cartwright. Um, I'm just going to second what uh, she said. Um, I think that one minute is not enough time for an open forum. That is something that's not on the agenda. And a lot of times <laughs> it can be a big issue. Um, I've brought open forum issues on the parks to the council. And it was hard work to get it into three minutes. <laughs> but we did. Um, and so I really do think that one minute is just not enough time. Um, I also have been a public speaker in on agenda items in um, city council meetings. And most of the time, three minutes is enough. But there are definitely times where it's not. So I'm not sure what you're gonna, conclusion you're gonna come to, but just know that there are those occasions where three minutes is, is just not enough to get that information out there. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so based on that, I'd like to withdraw my motion. Right and uh, ask Mr. Kirkland to uh, work on this a little longer and come back to us. Can I say one thing real quick I, sure. um, before we move forward? Um, I wanted to clarify something. It was Nobody on council wanted to limit public comment to one minute. Um, that, wasn't, that wasn't the plan. It wasn't the idea. Nobody ever mentioned wanting to do it. It wasn't one of the options that was presented to us as something that other cities do. It is not something that I think anybody on this council was going or even had a thought to do. That's all. And, and, and I do think, uh, I'll add to that, nobody uh, that I heard of wanted to do the, a one minute thing. I can't even say my name in one minute. So, um, but, but uh, um, I, think we d I think we are struggling with how to have a more open forum. So I do think this needs more work, and I would so really like to. Does it require us to table E, or what does it require? Yeah, what do you, what do you want me to do? I'm well, definitely withdrawing. You have withdrawing. a motion and a second. A withdrawal. I withdraw my motion. Not after the second. The second, second can agree to it, but once it's been seconded. Are you sure I can't pull it? Can I, well, I, if, I, I agree to, if I agree to the withdrawal, withdrawal then yeah, it's withdrawn. Withdraw second. Yeah, go I'll ahead. withdraw it. All right. OK. okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to table it or okay. anything. You just tell me to go work on it. Yeah, somewhere. I think we'd like to work on it some more. Maybe look to see what other cities are doing. Mm -hmm. With uh, respect to pooling time? To re with respect to, yeah, extending time, pooling time. I, I thought mm, so we I thought that we were okay on the pooling time. I thought that we had consensus on the pooling time. I think that the issue is on how how you balance the time limit on someone who wants to speak on an agenda item, I think, was the only issue. And, and I think the, the sure. Ms. Costello also talked about if, if somebody knows they want to speak for 10, 12 minutes, or could we have some kind of um, permission process, you know, for the agenda item? And so that, you know, particularly if there's technical, and I think that makes a lot of good sense. You know, for any of these items we were thinking about, there. So I think if you think about some kind of request, you know, process too. Well, uh, the. Those are. I think those are. The way it's worked in some other cities is that nobody gets to speak unless they've called the city secretary the day before and signed up to speak and told them what item and how much time they need, and they were you, they get one, two, or three minutes uh, to speak. If they need more time than that, then they have their. They lobby their council members to, to do a different approach to figuring out that issue. Well, on an agenda item, I mean, they may not know they want to speak until they hear. The agendas are posted in 72 hours in advance, so they have a, a weekend to find you. Sure, but I mean, <laughs> people could be sitting out there and hear me say something and go, whoa, that's really not, the, uh, uh, for example, what? Ms. Costello is saying, wait, 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 whoa, what about this? I mean, that's a very and valuable. And that's when you say, I want to table this agenda item to some other time for a fuller discussion of this. Or you ask your council members, your colleagues, to extend the time to delve into it right then. 
it, that's the point is so you all have some control over your meetings and how much time you're here on any given night and you have some accountability to your public as to what's going to be discussed at any particular night um, if you devote all of your time to one issue on an agenda item the other items don't get they get short shrift mm -hmm. And if you know, if you've got somebody that's got that much passion about an issue or you see that it takes more time, then you need to give it that time, but you need to set the time aside to do that. Um, the, that's, that's the point. And, and you have processes already to do that. You've had workshops on a variety of things, uh, and you'll have a whole month of workshops coming up. Um, you have presentations from outside groups on what they're doing and their specific ask or thank yous for support uh, that don't have time limits. Uh, and you have, we've adopted this process or created this process for uh, a particular issue to be brought forth by a council member and other peoples to speak on it. Um, I think you have all of the tools that you need there. You just... I, and we can put more in here if you want. Okay, let's let's work on that at a, at a future meeting. Okay, so the consensus I'm hearing is that you want three minutes on the limits, but you want one person donating time to another to make a maximum of six minutes, and something else. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more from my constituents before I before I. So you'll give some input to yeah, to Mr. Later Carper. On. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, number seven, uh, executive session, and uh, this is uh, deliberation uh, regarding economic development negotiations under government code section 551.087. Will we do that here? Persuade to Texas Government Code Section 551.087. Uh, we are returning uh, to, to regular session. And the last item on the agenda is adjourn. I adjourn this meeting.